It's very difficult. Uh, Paolo hasn't joined yet. Uh... We have only one minute to go, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, hi, Chandrasekhar. This is Moody. Hi, Moody. Great to see you. Good to see everyone. Good to see everyone. Well, yeah. as I'm soon as Professor Kappa Bianca joins, I think we should be able to start. I, I will try. I will try to call him. If you can, uh, I'm trying to get Domenico, but he's also not picking up the phone. Kenichi is with us. Kenichi is also with us. Great. Uh, yeah, we got him. And you know, Dan Kelly is also there. He is waving actually. Yeah, he he must be in the middle of the night, I suppose. Still. <laughs> yeah. Are you with us, Dr. Kelly? It's uh, he's trying to say something. Yes, uh, Dr. Kelly, sorry to wake you up early in the morning. Uh, they have not received the link. Uh, Paolo and Dan Kelly have not received the link. No, Dan, Dan is already with us. Pablo, oh, okay. I, had, I had sent, but I can send one again. Uh, Domenico, I had sent. It is the same link for all the faculty. It's the same link, so I will I will forward him to I will forward yeah, my, my, link, my for... link to him. Yeah, please. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you all to the WFNS IFNE Symposium in the eve of seventh. Uh, Neuroendoscopic Society of India conference. I'd like to uh, invite Professor Manasagrahi to start all the inaugural remarks. Manas, uh, are we waiting for Paolo, uh, Professor Kappa Bianca? Hey, Chandra Shekhar, can you guys hear me now? I think you unmuted me. Can you hear me? Hi, Uli. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, Good morning, wait. everyone. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we need to wait for Professor Kapabianka to join us. I think let us wait uh, maybe 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that should be okay because, uh, you know, I think there is a little confusion about this link. Uh, we should have probably said faculty link rather than. Uh, I got a message now that just getting the, okay. Yeah, I have sent the link to uh, Paolo Capabianca. So Great. hopefully he Thanks. will join in a few seconds. Thanks for the people to be here on a holiday weekend. <laughs> we have been having a perpetual holiday, I think, for such a long time. Uh, but just when we thought that things are coming back to normalcy, how's Africa, how's Kenya, uh, Moody? You you are Ka muted, Moody. Kapabianca is in. Great. Kapabianca is in. Uh, Dan, good uh, morning. Dr. Kapabianca. Hi, Paolo. Mm -hmm. hey. Uh, hey, Paolo, Felice. So I think uh, Manas, whenever we are ready. Okay. Paolo is muted. Oh, great photograph. Pa Paolo is not muted anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah. Ah, beautiful. I, I didn't receive the good times. Good times. Uh, the connection. Uh, just Very good sorry. Sent me now. Chandra, how are you in uh, in Mumbai? Uh, I am good now. Uh, wasn't so good two weeks ago, but uh, recovered well. Ah, great. Just a second, and I will be. Just a second. Yes, yes. 
once you are ready then we are uh, ready to start this is a nice photograph i must say yeah uh, so taken last year last year yeah in april hmm yeah okay and dr debuji came the next day i think that's why i that's think. right i came a day later this was the yeah. day one of 2020 uh, a workshop nepal's workshop yeah uh, i think almost all yeah. faculty of the symposium are here and then it was just yeah. spreading in china yeah. yeah yeah nice photograph in Ooh. fact uh, as soon as we got back we got the news that uh, <laughs> this thing has started in italy and uh, stuff like that I hope that now you will uh, you have the, um, the my screen yes yes okay i i am ready okay. tell me when uh, we we can we can move yeah um uh, uh, good evening Uh, i'd like to welcome you all for this uh, meeting of the national society of uh, endoscopy society of india and the oration of nasi along with the wfns and ifme symposium uh, this was supposed to be held last year the, along with the interim meeting of uh, ifne but uh, because of covid it all uh, got postponed uh, we had the meeting at nepals and followed by the uh, everything uh, Uh, went uh, differently uh, though all of us uh, suffer uh, from uh, uh, covid and suffer from uh, uh, not meeting each other but it has it has uh, got lot of uh, positive things uh, we have listened to many good lectures in this year uh, sitting at home and uh, all the faculty uh, without spending wasting their time in traveling they have, they have taught us uh, many things i like to thank dr dev pujari dr kureshi and dr nishiyama of the wf fitness committee who organized all the uh, faculty and the orator for our meeting uh, for this evening and all the faculty and orator in spite of uh, in spite of being in odd time of the day they agreed to be part of this meeting um, before uh, so i but then uh, initially we thought that we should not have this uh, meeting uh, we kept on postponing for a year finally we decided that uh, we have a hybrid meeting uh, so the foreign foreign faculty are uh, uh, on online format and uh, the national people are we are meeting physically uh, but unfortunately because of the second wave uh, many of them national faculty also have gone to virtual mode so i'll request all faculty to participate tomorrow and day after tomorrow in the meeting and uh, covid uh, has given a lot of positive things uh, that we uh, have learned uh, we have learned in a very short time from many faculty uh, from both national and international sitting at home uh, and uh, covid has made a different change i cannot address as a good evening to everybody i have to tell good morning good evening and uh, good afternoon because many faculty are from different parts of the country uh, with this few words i'll request uh, president of the society dr suresh shankla uh, to uh, give a few words on the oration and thank you all thank you manas can i uh, share my screen uh pavlo you will have to uh, unshare for some time okay in the room we are on this yes share for some time okay 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 thank you thanks a lot uh so first of all i would like to thank uh, the organizing committee particularly dr subodh raju and dr uh, manas uh, who have really worked hard to organize this meeting at such a difficult time Uh, and managed to put everything together for all of us on behalf of uh, the neuro oncology neuro uh, endoscopic society of india i would like to welcome all the faculty of the IF, ifne and wfns symposium today uh, as well as uh, all the delegates from all over the world who have uh, took off some time and uh, uh, tried to get connected 
to us uh, and participate in this meeting. The Neuro Endoscopy Society uh, oration was uh, started in 2014 uh, with our society established in uh, uh, 2013 and uh, the very next year onwards we started having our annual uh, conferences and along with that we have the oration society in which we have invited all the prominent endoscopic, neuroendoscopic surgeons from all over the parts of the world. So uh, Professor Amin Kassam was the first uh, uh, orator, was in, uh, invited in Mumbai conference in 2014, uh, was followed by uh, Professor Charles Theo in 2015, and then our own uh, president IFNE, Professor Henry Schroeder came to uh, visit us in New Delhi and uh, delivered his oration in 2016. And then uh, Professor Chinali came to Jaipur in 2017. Uh, Joachim Ortil uh, visited us in 2018 as an orator. Uh, and in our last conference in 2019, Professor Shlomi Constantini uh, came uh, to uh, Madurai for our sixth annual conference. In 2020, we could not organize the conference. And in 2021, in 2021's meeting, uh, we are uh, so lucky to have uh, Professor Kappa Bienka as our uh, society orator this year. Now my slide is not moving. Yes, there it is. Okay. So uh, on behalf of this, the Neuro Neuroendoscopic Society of India, I would like to thank the Professor Kappa Bianca for having uh, accepted our uh, um, invitation to join us today as an orator of uh, uh, seventh annual conference of Neuroendoscopic Society of India. Uh, I would uh, like Professor uh, Dev Pujari to introduce uh, our today's orator, Professor Kappa Bianca. Dr. Dev Pujari, please. I will... Can you unshare your screen, uh, Suresh? Yes, I'll do that. Okay. It's really an honor and uh, pleasure to introduce Paolo. Uh, I think uh, Paolo doesn't really need any introduction uh, to this audience. Uh, he's really very well known and we have been hoping for the last couple of years to uh, have him for our uh, annual neuroendoscopy meetings. But somehow it has uh, not been possible uh, earlier because of uh, him being busy and then uh, uh, because of the COVID situation that we have had to cancel the meeting last year. But it has been very nice that he has been able to join us today, however, uh, 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 in a virtual manner. And I really uh, appreciate him uh, joining us today. Professor Kappa Bianca, uh, born in Naples, and he has a unique distinction of having been trained in the same uh, uh, hospital and university where he is now uh, chairing the uh, department of neurosurgery and he has really uh, been he has been the chairman uh, 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 he's currently the chairman uh, of the department and uh, earlier in from 2009 to 2013 he's been the chairman of the neuroendoscopy committee of the wfns uh, all of us know that he's a prolific writer he's author of more than 200 peer reviewed articles and written more than 20 books and book chapters he's been organized uh, uh, organizer par excellence and uh, has uh, done many national and international congresses uh, with workshops. I actually had the pleasure of meeting him. He may not uh, probably remember clearly in 1998 when Axel Pernesky did the uh, minimally invasive uh, neurosurgery congress where he, I think for the first time, probably presented the functional endoscopy pituitary surgery as it was uh, earlier called. And I have also had a pleasure of hosting him in Mumbai for our annual Ginde oration in 2010 and had the pleasure of working with him during the Rome uh, and the Belgrade workshops of WFNS. Paolo is not only a very accomplished neurosurgeon uh, and uh, 
contributed to uh, teaching in India, but he has also been a friend of India. And uh, you can understand this by the fact that he has uh, backpacked as a young doctor in uh, India and has had uh, a very, very intimate experience uh, during an early stage in life. So I welcome Paolo for this uh, uh, prestigious oration and uh, thank him for accepting our invitation. Thanks. I think uh, uh, I would invite uh, Professor Kappa Bianca to uh, start his oration speech, please. Uh, I need to thank you for your kind words. Um, and uh, I really feel a friend of uh, India, uh, but not only of India, uh, in the meaning that uh, we, are, we are a community of people uh, sharing experiences and kind of life uh, as uh, the, 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 the meeting of today uh, can clearly show we are all together uh, aiming at uh, improving the quality, the quality of our work and all of us uh, are working today uh, where in many countries uh, this is a sort of pre-holiday um, season. Uh, uh, anyway, um, the, the topic of today is a uh, no, no, perché the management of today? Non è questo, no, no, excuse me, uh, I'm wrong with the presentation. And you may go to the full screen. Uh, uh, no, no, just a second. No, non voglio questo. I was wrong. No, no, I was wrong with the presentation. I put, I introduced another. That's the last one. I should never do. I, I put another presentation. That was uh, your last month's presentation. <laughs> right. I was. No messa sulla scrivania. Ah, ecco, ecco. Sì, 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 questo. No, no, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, grazie, grazie. Uh, can you follow me? Do you hear me? Yes, I, we can hear you well, but we are still not seeing your screen. Please share screen. Yeah, yeah. I hope we are going to, to share the right one. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, sharing the screen. I, I think we are right now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. No, because uh, uh, I, I put another presentation, not the one of today, because I was just saying that uh, reconstruction uh, in skull-based surgery is not the, the end of the, of the work we have done. It's an important step of our surgery. So uh, I, we have worked a lot, as you will see, and uh, all of us have worked a lot on this topic because uh, uh, has been a sort of Achilles heel of the, of the technique. And now we have, uh, I, I think we have uh, reached the goal uh, and we have worked many years for this. So, um, okay, okay. Uh, this is Naples, uh, the volcano uh, I, I like to show. And this is the, uh, our work uh, through both nostrils. We enter the, we reach the skull base. Uh, and this was already done uh, many, uh, centuries ago for aesthetical purposes, not to disfigure the face during the mummification process. And we have uh, uh, these instruments that are kept in, uh, in, in Egypt, not only in Egypt, I've seen also in the ancient Greece and uh, in London, in, in some places, we have studies about this. And since that times, there has been a, a great evolution because uh, uh, people have worked without the microscope with the bulb on, on the forehead 
and then the uh, x-ray control during surgery the microscope today almost all the um, surgeons in the world use this endoscopic technique and uh, so you see that also coming from the transcranial roots uh, uh, most of surgeries now for pituitary surgery more than 97 percent and also skull based surgery improving and improving every day uh, through the mouth or, and then the nose or di directly through the nose to reach the skull base and uh, you see we can and uh, you see that uh, in 1897 uh, the chief surgeon of the hospital of venice was the first to introduce this uh, this, this kind of approach on the cadaver uh, and um, but um, the first surgeries were performed in 1907 by in um, in in in, um, in Bayern, uh, from uh, with Schlöffel. Even though uh, the one who popularized this kind of approach was uh, uh, Heinrich Bushi, who used this approach but then abandoned the approach uh, after having taught to different surgeons, Norman Dot in Edinburgh, uh, Gerard Guyot in Paris, uh, and also Jules Hardy that learned also from Gerard Guyot. Uh, uh, you see Norman Dot, you see here uh, uh, Gerard Guyot, a very talented surgeon, Jules Hardy, uh, um, who was important in our opinion, not only because uh, uh, introduced the microscope, but also for the concept of microadenoma, just one centimeter lesion responsible of the symptoms of the approach. But uh, uh, the shift uh, really happened at the end of last uh, millennium, I would say, because the a duo of a neurosurgeon, but uh, following the technology of the endoscope and the studies of a, a, an ENT surgeon, uh, Rick Carrao, uh, this man, we are indebted to this man, introduced the, the approach with the endoscope to the, uh, the, to the cell. And you see here uh, other groups uh, in Italy um, also worked hard on the topic. And you see here what is possible to see close to the relevant target, the pituitary gland with the vascularization of inferior and superior hypovisial arteries, lateral to the pituitary, the internal carotid artery, above the pituitary, the chias, and the pituitary stalk. So we understood after uh, in our experience, three, four hundred surgeries, but we understood that, what, that there was a, a huge world uh, uh, that could be seen around the cell. So we started to study and to learn how to manage this world, uh, composed of giant adenomas, of meningiomas, uh, CSF leaks, uh, craniopharyngiomas. Now, for craniopharyngiomas, I would say that is the preferred uh, approach way for this kind of surgery. Uh, uh, th this week, uh, uh, we, we have done a tuberculum cell meningioma uh, with the endoscope and with this technique. A craniopharyngioma, Professor Cavallo just uh, finished together with uh, Dr. Solari, uh, the surgery of craniopharyngioma today. Um, a meningioma of the cerebellum pontae and angle. Uh, and uh, tomorrow we have uh, the, the, the compression of the optic nerve for um, uh, another, uh, another pathology. So uh, there, is a, there are many possibilities and many pathologies to, the, to be approached, as you see here, because in our experience of more than 2,000 surgeries, uh, three quarter uh, are pituitary adenomas, but all other kind of pathologies uh, are different than adenomas. At the end of surgery, and we have to distinguish standard transphenoidal surgery uh, the, the, from extended approach uh, to the skull base, there is an important 
important uh, um, need to reconstruct from below uh, the, the approach way uh, where it's uh, difficult uh, to suture the dura. Uh, we have against the, 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 the an action against ours that's a brand, brand, brand pulsation and the gravity. So we have to study properly what to do. And uh, the, the criteria even here are also the same uh, that we used before, because we have to try to reconstruct properly the compartments we have gone through. And um, a lot of work has been done by many, many uh, groups working at, uh, at this, this topic. Our group, uh, the Bologna group, the New York group, the Pittsburgh group, uh, uh, Amin Kassam, that has been always very uh, intu intuitive uh, to find the right way. And uh, the need to reconstruct probably the approach when you have violated the arachnoid plane is that the risk is, uh, first of all, the hypertensive pneumocephalus that's, uh, that acts uh, as a tumor, and even if rare, meningitis. You see here, it's devastating what can happen with the pneumocephalus. And uh, often at the end of approach, we, re we um, remember to put the patient absolutely flat, in a flat position, to favor the out the outflow of the air that every time enters the skull. And uh, uh, as I told you before, different is the standard the approach than the extended approach. And uh, the rate of uh, CF, CSF leak, both intraoperative and postoperative. But in the extended approach at the beginning was very high. Uh, in many series around 20%, that's not acceptable. So uh, a, a lot of surgeons have studied uh, different techniques to deal with this problem. And uh, to deal with this problem. And uh, also it's important to try to understand which uh, is the ideal material to, to, uh, to work with because uh, it's important not to uh, have an inflammatory response. Uh, the, the material has not to be uh, uh, toxic. Uh, it, there, it, there is the need to adhere to the surrounding tissues and uh, uh, sterilization is important, quick availability and easy handling of the, of the material and uh, everything has to be um, even convenient. So, if you look at the history of this kind of topic, as uh, how has been managed, you see that uh, uh, in 1909 was uh, used the gauze, uh, then Cushy used fascialata, muscle, mucopericondial, fat, so many different uh, um, ways to, to manage. And I'm going to it's not patience. Okay, no, no, okay. Um, many different uh, ways. Uh, the, the shift, the real change happened with uh, the vital flaps uh, um, conceived by the uh, Argentinian guys, Adad and Bassagastei, but popularized by the uh, group leaded by Amin Kassam in Pittsburgh uh, around 2005-2006. Um, and going to the uh, materials, uh, the best are those harvested from the patient. First of all, the abdominal fat breath, and then the fascialata. And uh, also used are uh, uh, heterologous substances like lyophilized bovine uh, pericardium. Uh, and also the glues, uh, not everyone, but we use it and many uh, groups use uh, surgical glues uh, to have a watertight closure to hold the materials in place you uh, you are put for reconstruction and also for hemostatic properties. Uh, you see uh, here some of these uh, substances. And uh, just to let you see how was uh, uh, important for us this topic that you see, uh, this is our first publication in 1985 where we said where we 
um, used three different ways intradural, extradural packing, and both intra and extradural. You see here, this was an uh, in, uh, artistic drawing of an intradural closure, extradural closure, uh, both intra extradural with the indications that are already fixed uh, for this kind of, um, of pathology. Uh, I always uh, I'm interested, and uh, for me it's always important to fix the importance of the uh, of the work done by Kassam and Carrao. Carrao was the first to study very well the anatomy, and Kassam was uh, strong and intuitive uh, in, in finding the way and in leading the way of those times. But uh, there was a problem of the CSF leak, uh, the Achilles seal of the approach. And you see how, how many uh, important works in the international literature uh, was performed by us and by other groups. Because there is, a, uh, in this kind of approaches, a large bone and neural defect, uh, which is quite often irregular, uh, neurovascular structures bordering Lottery and severely uh, the, the, the defect you, we have created. And uh, as in cryopharyngiomas, all uh, large arachnoid opening, always large arachnoid opening. And uh, you have also to think uh, later when uh, there is the need uh, during surgery, uh, as an after effect, uh, third ventricular, large opening. But you have also to think of what your uh, can be needed to do after uh, radiotherapy for chordomas from for craniopharyngiomas. So uh, you have to um, put a, um, to do a very good job uh, filling the dead space, uh, fixing the, the the packing in place, uh, reinforcing with the, uh, glues. And again, this is a a, a work on a big series made by Amin Kassam with. The, excellent drawings. You see here um, uh, the flap. How can you see uh, getting a very good uh, vascularization? The technique we use now, we have called 3F, which means the fat we use as a first stop. Second, the flap, designed by the Argentinian guys and popularized by Kassam. And fast, which means uh, um, fast leaving the bed from the patient. The day after surgery, we made we make a CT scan and then uh, we have the patient walking uh, around. You see here the fat. The fat we use just like a cork stopper uh, inside and outside the defect, uh, as you can see in this drawing. Uh, it's important not to overpack. Uh, otherwise, you can have uh, chasmatic compression. Uh, the flap, uh, the nasoceptor flap, uh, and uh, here is the, uh, um, a, a short video clip showing we harvest the flap just uh, at the end of the removal. We don't do it at the beginning of the operation, uh, trying to have it as, as more vital as possible and uh, um, put it on the on the white defect, then uh, some little sponges and and uh, and glue and fibrin glue, uh, which um, uh, makes possible the, vas the uh, fast vascularization and fixing uh, uh, the flap on the, on the defect. And um, this is it. And the flush uh, early mobilization, postoperative day one. We don't use any more lumbar drainage. We don't put uh, uh, the patient supine, but uh, with the head raised uh, from the bed. And uh, this is a um, considerations about uh, uh, 71 cases. You see 38% craniopharyngiomas, meningiomas. Um, uh, in 61% uh, there was third, vent third ventricle opening. And uh, if you see the BMI, uh, you can understand how these patients uh, are uh, uh, overweighted. And um, in these 71 cases, from June 2017 to January uh, 2021, we had to perform one revision surgery uh, for a major 
CSF leak. But I have to tell you that was a patient with a dermoid cyst, which uh, often uh, gives a, a chemical, a sort of chemical meningitis. And um, another one we were able to fix with uh, uh, injections of uh, uh, fibrin glue uh, with patients awake. Uh, uh, so it was much easier. And um, this is a, a video clip uh, uh, of a very um, a young lady coming from, a, from abroad with a chondrosarcoma. You see here, after removal of this very big lesion, all the steps we perform. Um, the fat, first of all, you see, we put the fat, the, uh, the fat. and uh, after the fat uh, the, that's put in place, uh, as I told you, uh, we harvest the flap and uh, uh, put just the flap over the fat. You see here this pulsation, just a few drops of fibrin glue, and then the nasoceptor flop. Covering, uh, covering this deeper. This is it. A uh, few sponges, you see here, and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the control after surgery, one year post-operative MRI. So today uh, we fill the cavity with uh, fat as a cork, then a uh, few drops of fibrin glue, and then the flap. And uh, next steps. Uh, next steps, we are working today with uh, um, some models, uh, with also the 3D printers to make possible to um, have some application to understand before you're going to do what you will uh, perform uh, during surgery. And uh, it's important to, to learn the lessons from what we have done uh, and, and, and not think to, do, to have reached any goal. Uh, the, 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 the very good goal is the one we will uh, have uh, the next day performing surgery for our patient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kapabianka, for a wonderful uh, talk and uh, how uh, uh, your concepts of uh, reconstruction have developed over the years. Uh, your classification of CSF leak has also become a uniformly accepted and most people use it for comparing various sequences. So uh, you have a huge contribution and we are really very happy to uh, have uh, uh, heard this lecture from you today. Uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Manas, please take over uh, the felicitation. Uh, before we proceed to the symposium. Uh, Dr. Subodh is there? Sub Dr. Subodh? Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, Dr. Subodh is not. Yeah, uh, good evening, Manas. Uh, one minute. Have you got it ready? Uh, I've got it ready, just a minute. I'm uh, just, I'm going to the screen. Yeah. As he arranges the plaque to be handed over to Professor uh, uh, Kapabianka. Uh, this is the meeting we had uh, with Professor uh, Kapabianka last year, uh, which Professor Sinali had uh, organized at Naples uh, just before COVID. So we just escaped Italy. Probably one week later, would have been stuck in Italy, me, Dr. Suresh, Dr. Dev Pujari, all of them. Um, and, um, so uh, uh, that the first time I met Professor Kapabianka, and then uh, um, I and then suddenly I remember that I had this photograph, so I, I took it out. Uh, 
this is uh, in this occasion we can't have anything real so it's a small uh, virtual plaque for uh, uh, professor kavapianka acknowledging him for giving a wonderful uh, lecture in our seventh annual meeting of the new university society and uh, we'll hand over him the plaque physically Once whoever meets him from India, yes. Dr. Manas, please. Yeah, I like uh, your kind acceptance. I'm really honored to to be part of this uh, very good, nice, important group of sergeants and friends. Yeah, uh, next time uh, we go to the Naples meeting, we'll carry this flag with you and hand over personally. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Professor Kapoorka for uh, spending his time uh, to give this oration for the, the Neuroendoscopic Society of India. And uh, now I hand over the chair to uh, Professor Deo Pujari to conduct the session, uh, the symposium of WFNS and IFNE, IFNE together. Thank you, uh, Manas. Uh, uh, I think we have had a wonderful session and we are now uh, looking forward to another feast of uh, six lectures by uh, our colleagues uh, uh, from, uh, uh, well, many other uh, places. Uh, uh, we have colleagues from uh, Europe as well as from United States. And uh, uh, the symposium is being, uh, moderated by my co-chairman of the WFNS committee, uh, Dr. Moody Qureshi uh, from Kenya and the IFNE uh, sec uh, General Secretary, uh, Dr. Kenichi Nishiyama from uh, Tokyo. Uh, can I ask uh, Kenichi and uh, Moody to take over and uh, start the proceedings of the uh, symposium, please? Yes, okay. Thank you very much. Uh... It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be part of this feast, as you call it, uh, Chandrasekhar, because after a huge series of uh, the IFNE webinars and the WFNS webinars, uh, we now have the opportunity, thanks to the Neurosurgical Society of India, uh, Neuroendoscopy uh, Society of India, to host such a galaxy of international stars and uh, I would like uh, my colleague from India to uh, pronounce the first uh, lecture because I don't have it on my list, but uh, it's a pleasure to be participating in such a wonderful uh, a symposium. Thank you very much. Kenichi, would you like to say something before we ask, has Stefan joined us yet? Okay. Yes, I'm Thank here. Hi. Great, Stefan. So I think you you would be starting the session. Okay, yeah. Kenichi, do you do you want to say yeah. something before? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's Murray already said to me. Yeah. And um, please enjoy the wonderful uh, six talks. So the first speaker is the Professor Stefan Busberger. He's uh, the uh, expert in, uh, especially in the field of robotic neurosurgery or the uh, the the uh, today the uh, neural navigation. So, uh, your talk is neural navigation in for neuroendoscopic surgery. Okay. Okay. Let me try uh, once more. Okay. Please. Yes. I please start your talk. Can you? Stefan, I have to. I most of you already know that Stefan is a, a, a senior neurosurgeon from uh, Austria, from University of Vienna, and. Uh, uh, we have the pleasure to hear him uh, today. Uh, I think you are going to talk about ventricular as well as uh, skull-based endoscopic surgery. Is that correct? No, I have to apologize. It's only about ventricular uh, navigation. Uh -huh. But I have to restart this computer. It doesn't want to show my screen. Sorry for that. If you, if you don't mind, take the second lecture before me. Yeah? If that's okay with you. Sorry? Should yeah? be okay. Chandra. Okay. Should be okay. Mm-hmm. The second talk is uh, Uli. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uli, can you hear me? 
I hear you. I hear you very yeah. well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Can you can you start talk? Yes. Yeah. Also... Already. Yeah. Okay. I'm I don't know what's about you. Yeah. Professor Lito Mara is one of the leaders of the pediatric neurosurgery. So he will talk about endoscopy for arachnoid cysts from Berlin. Thank you very much, Kanishi. Thank you very much uh, to uh, all the society um, of neural endoscopy in India. It's a great, great pleasure as well as a great honor, of course, to uh, give our experience of endoscopy for arachnoid cysts, uh, which I will talk about now in the next uh, few minutes. Um, in general, arachnoid cysts are intra-arachnoid um, uh, CSF accumulation, which are mostly congenital. They account for one to two percent of intracranial mass lesions, and uh, normally uh, most of them will be discovered in the first decade of life. However, there is a big uh, heterogeneity uh, when they are diagnosed. If we look at different uh, positions where uh, we see them. Um, it's, of course, uh, the temporal fissure or sylvian fissure arachnoid cysts are most often seen, convexity, interhemispheric, supracellar, uh, quadrigerminal plate, intraventricular, um, or in infrontentorial uh, location, we have the cerebellopontine angle or the retrocerebellar um, um, positions. In terms of clinical manifestations, of course, depending on the localization, it can be a uh, different neurological signs. However, uh, you may uh, have half of the patients um, being symptomatic with raised intracranial pressure or hydrocephalus uh, signs, which can develop secondarily to uh, um, an arachnoid cyst. It's very interesting when we talk about symptoms of uh, arachnoid cysts, and this is uh, specifically for the Sylvian Fisher ones, we should not only look at headaches or neurological deficits, but there have been recent uh, investigations about neuropsychological impairments and also neurocognitive problems. Here's a uh, um, paper from um, South Korea, and they showed that there were some memory deficits uh, which can be seen uh, in patients with arachnoid cysts compared to control cohorts. But more importantly, you can see that there are actually psychological impairments. Here, there's one group who uh, is becoming obvious with uh, psychological internalization, anxiety or withdrawal, or another group of patients can actually have uh, an opposite uh, symptomatology, which is more going towards uh, like an... Um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder with like um, externalization, aggressive behavior, um, or a social immaturity. Um, we are often talk about growth of those cysts. And uh, there's another um, paper from South Korea. And here you can see they actually grow only in the first two years of life. And after that, um, except the uh, supracellar arachnoid cyst, they normally don't grow, but just remain and the symptoms may come um, through the compliance, which may be different over lifetime span. Uh, what about the risk of rupture, uh, which is also a discussion if we should um, operate on them, yes or no. And uh, this is very difficult to uh, quantify. And there are many different uh, figures here, 0.1% uh, per year. Um, as mentioned by partial or 2.2% uh, in general uh, risk of rupture, which might um, be related um, to a minor fall or a head injury. The indications for treatments, uh, mostly we uh, look at them conservatively, especially for the small non-space occupying incidental discoveries or asymptomatic patients. Uh, and surgical treatment may be indicated if there are signs of increased intracranial pressure, hydrocephalus, or symptoms which are clearly related to the arachnoid cysts. However, the biggest portions is maybe the controversial ones, and those are the ones who are arachnoid cysts with mass, mass effect, but uh, they might have no or only mild or unspecific symptoms, which we cannot 100% relate to the uh, localization of the cyst itself. If we decide for surgery, 
then we decide between microsurgery, endoscopy, and shunting. Um, of course, if you are, we are talking about endoscopic today, and that's what we are doing in the majority of cases, we have the uh, advantage that it's less invasive, um, might have less complications if you are experienced enough in endoscopy. Um, and the aim is always to perform just the fenestration of CSF in the cyst towards the uh, uh, physiological uh, CSF spaces. Uh, disadvantage is, is the learning curve. And this is um, uh, maybe a little bit more difficult than microsurgical technique. Cystoperitoneal shunt should not be used uh, routinely because a cyst in the head is not hydrocephalous, so we should not drain it to another part of the body. It's actually only an um, isolation of water which should be brought into communication with other CSF spaces. So endoscopy is actually, um, in our opinion, the best option. What are the challenges? Uh, the challenge is to uh, define the right entry point in order to have the best trajectory. And those entry points um, will be uh, at least be defined by uh, our target and they might be very individual. That's why navigation and planning is very important. Uh, Stefan Wolfsberger will talk about this later. Our concept is to use whatever navigation technique, uh, which is mostly feasible and uh, most efficient. Um, and then decide about each cyst, but we always use any of those in uh, all individual cases. For navigation, we use often um, augmented reality navigation, where we not only register the endoscope, but also the visual field of the endoscope in order to implement contours and targets and trajectory into our field of view in order to have a better um, overview of the uh, procedure itself. This is an example of an uh, Sylvian Fischer arachnoid cyst, which you can see here. Um, this is actually um, the direct um, view into the cyst, and here you can see the carotid artery, and this is the uh, posterior window uh, just behind the carotid artery. You can see little, uh, a lot of layers of membranes. Most of them are very tight. That's why it's necessary to open them uh, often with scissors. We don't cut directly. We just take it in order to spread layer by layer down until we get an opening uh, to be not as aggressive and to uh, avoid any kind of injury to the underlying structures. Why do we, we use navigation here? We use navigation not to find the cyst, but more important to have the perfect trajectory in order to work towards the little space behind the membrane, which is the pre pontine cistern, uh, and then have a good drainage of the cyst inside. This is the post-operative view. We don't want necessarily to have the um, cyst disappear. We just to want to have uh, it uh, being smaller and less compressing the brain um, and avoid hygroma if any possible. Uh, here's another case, uh, temporal arachnoid cyst, seven year old with chronic headaches, with pro a progressive visual impairment. This was quite a severe case. You can see the posterior portion of the cyst, uh, oculomotor nerve, um, carotid optic um, uh, nerve right here. And the windows where we normally work on are around the oculomotor nerve. Here's, um, you can see how tight the membranes can be. Um, and that it's quite difficult sometimes. And that again, we need to have the scissors go with the scissors closed, open on the surface and then spread layer by layer until um, we will have a little uh, window. And then this can be either cut or opened with other um, techniques like Fogatti uh, catheter or spreading the layer and rupturing. Here, we, this is what we would like to see. We would like to see the brainstem and the prepontine cistern in order to have a very good drainage into uh, um, the basal cistern. And this is, again, the post-operative images compared to the pre-operative. Again, a volume relief and thereby reduction of the mass effect. Um, we have also used uh, the MINOP INVENT, which is an endoscope where you can introduce two um, instruments into the um, uh, working channel, and thereby we have the ability uh, to work here with a hook, for example, 
and uh, take uh, the membranes to lift them up. We already did a little hole. And then in the second step, we can take with the forceps and then with a scissor to um, elevate the membranes and then cut the membrane uh, with the scissors uh, directly. For this procedure, we need to fix the uh, endoscope, which is a little bit more cumbersome. Usually we are uh, two um, neurosurgeons. One is guiding the endoscope. The other one is guiding and working with the instruments itself. Um, this is the post-operative image that was quite an amazing result in terms of volume reduction. Uh, the cyst uh, almost completely disappeared. We did some investigations on our experience the, uh, on the temporal um, uh, arachnoid cysts. Here you can see the volume reduction. This can be uh, quantified, uh, which we published in our pleasure together with uh, our Japanese colleagues uh, in um, 2015 in world neurosurgery and we can see that we have a significant reduction of the cyst itself um, which is long-standing and also with if you calculate the cyst plus the hygroma volume which sometimes may develop and the uh, reduction of this volume continues so it's not only at three months but also further reduction at 15 months um, we had 24 cysts um, and most of them were actually type 2 or type 3 galassi. Um, we had eight were actually ruptured cysts, and those were treated also endoscopically primarily, so not with any shunt or external drainages. Um, the acute symptoms could almost be all of them reduced completely uh, or resolved completely. The headaches resolved in 50%. Um, improved in 25% and remained unchanged in 25%. The chronic symptoms were differently. We had asymptomatic postoperative hygroma in six cases, um, no surgery required, five resolved uh, within the second MRI, and no CSF leak, no infection, one transient fourth nerve palsy, which um, resolved after three months at follow-up appointment. Um, what is very interesting in those cysts, there was um, a newer uh, publication came out in March uh, 2020, where they looked at cognition, uh, 11 patients from Karolinska Institute, uh, age, mean age was 9.5 years, and they had the significant improvement after surgery um, for verbal comprehension, for perception and face memory. Uh, and this is very important, I think, which we need to investigate further on. Um, in order to see what is really the indication for surgery. A big um, patient cohort was published from the Paris group and they compared microsurgical technique to neuroendoscopic technique and concluded that neuroendoscopy was not as good because they needed more resurgeries than microsurgery. However, they used endoscopy um, in more bigger cysts, so galassi type three cysts and much more younger children. Uh, so I don't know if this uh, data is quite valid. We compared our survival curve and we uh, had also, we had this 80% um, non-reoperated uh, cysts, which is just in between of both um, of those curves um, compared to the NECA group. Um, so there are some reoperations. And here you can see that we not always use endoscopy. Here's the Sylvian Fischer arachnoids. We have also used some microsurgery and microsurgery is always used then if we don't see a clear window uh, towards the basal cisterns. And then we would like to fenestrate towards uh, maybe the south thigh or the temporal horn, depending on the anatomy. And these are the reoperations here. Uh, we used um, half of the patient endoscopy again, and then microsurgery in three of the patients and one needed to have a shunt, but this was actually then developing a hydrocephalus, which was not 100% clear why that happened. Again, the ruptured cysts on this side, uh, without infants, uh, a clear improvement in terms of volume reduction, which was significant uh, in the long-term follow-up MRI. Um, so I think still also ruptured cysts may be treated endoscopically combining a lavage technique and then a regular fenestration, uh, but however, the numbers are quite small. Supercellular arachnoid cysts are the classical indication for neuroendoscopy. Um, and the uh, idea is to fenestrate the uh, super um, cellular arachnoid cysts on the upper cranial membrane as well as on the lower uh, membrane. Um, 
those are normally growing cysts because they have a valve mechanism um, at the level of the um, of the basilary um, artery. Um, here you can see an arachnoid cyst which we treated uh, despite the fact that there was no hydrocephalus, narrow ventricles. So we used um, neural navigation in order to find the ventricle safely and then worked within the narrow ventricle by irrigation to elevate the size a little bit. Um, and then we uh, were actually able to uh, work on the cranial membrane that was first coagulated and then later cut with scissors to be opened. Um, and, oh, that was already finished, no. Um, and then let's see where, where we are. Yeah. Um, so we opened the upper membrane and this is now the view inside the cyst. Here you can see the clivus, the pituitary, um, and the, the uh, um, circulus of Belize of the um, artery uh, branches. And then we, can identify the valve mechanism just in front of the um, uh, basilary artery and do another opening right here. Um, and you can see here the abducens nerve and the brainstem um, just behind it. These are the post-operative image, very nice reduction of volume. And here's our track for the endoscopy. Um, uh, here we can also use another navigation technique, which we call the guiding technique, uh, where we use uh, um, the measurement of the uh, angulation towards the convexity in the coronal um, um, image, and this can be calculated by a smartphone or by a PC um, uh, software, and uh, by adjusting the trajectory angulation in the correct manner here, 10, uh, 10 degrees medially, we can directly insert the endoscope into the ventricle. Um, Here's the example. You can see a moderate enlargement of the ventricles, quite a um, big size of a subarachnoid um, cyst. You can enter with the optic of the um, MINOP endoscope into the ventricle directly. Um, of course, it's very important to measure the coordinates uh, from the nasion and lateral to the midline, and then to have the perfect trajectory to reach the lower um membrane especially through the foramen of magnum uh, of the monroe i'm sorry um and here you can see now the foramen of monroe this upper cyst membrane um which is also the flow of the third ventricle and then the opening um and then the opening on the lower portion again here you can see the abducens nerve this is the oculomotor nerve here's the cl uh, clivus um, and the pituitary right there. Um, there was a meta-analysis between uh, different articles um, just published uh, in 2020. Uh, first endoscopic technique in supercellular arachnoid cysts was 1993 by Rapport uh, and colleagues, and they uh, suggested that ventricular cystonostomy, so opening both membranes, is superior only to opening uh, just one brain, the upper, uh, the upper membrane, which would be a ventricular cystostomy. Uh, they had some complications reported in different articles, six nerve palsy, hormone disturbances, high groma, and shunt rate was not really mentioned. Uh, but in general, it was much superior compared to microsurgery and also to shunting. Um, some other cases, this is the laminar quadrigeminal cyst with a compression of the aqueduct. Um, again, we choose a transventricular approach, uh, navigate it, and here you can see how difficult it would be to find the right opening without navigation. Um, and we have finally did the uh, opening um, of the ipsilateral membrane um, at the first portion, and then we enter inside the cyst. Uh, and then here you can see the contralateral membrane. And again, the navigation will mark us the place where we should do the second cystostomy. And then it will be performed as well uh, to have an opening towards both membrane. Here's the preoperative image. This is the postoperative image to have a good, a good decompression and then open aqueduct at the end of surgery. Uh, posterior fossa um, arachnoid cyst can be um, combined with, uh, with hydrocephalus due to compression of the uh, fourth ventricle, which is the case here. 
it's quite a long-standing uh, hydrocephalus and it was compensated due to any reason. Um, we did navigation again here uh, to have a good entry point just below the transfer sinus, as well as have good opening lateral to the um, uh, brainstem uh, and maybe also to the um, fourth ventricular membranes. Um, these are the postoperative images and with just fenestrating the uh, membranes of the cyst, we also resolved the hydrocephalus. Um, however, we cannot reverse the atrophy, which was related to this long-standing hydrocephalus for the long run. Um, here we had another case where we performed for a retrocerebellar arachnoid cyst and an opening transventricular and, and performed an ETV in parallel. Um, here you can see the membrane which came, uh, came up all the way to the lateral ventricle. Um, here's the view inside the cyst, a tentorial edge, um, and, the re and the cerebellum right here. This is the retrocerebellar space. And then in the second, we did an ETV. Um, and here you can see the ETV opening right here. And uh, we placed um, a stent catheter, which enables to um, keep the stoma open in the posterior portion and then have perforation nodes here and perforation nodes here connected to a reservoir, but no shunt, um, just a connection stent uh, to establish the communication. Microsurgery is sometimes needed if you have this uh, cerebellopontine uh, angle uh, arachnoid cysts, which I, I think are not as good for pure endoscopy, might be good for um, assisted neuroendoscopic techniques. Here's the postoperative images. Um, in the posterior fossa arachnoid cysts, you have, of course, to uh, distinguish between um, uh, cyst enlarged cisterna magna or uh, Blake's pouch or Dandy Walker malformations. And therefore we look for communication, compression and hydrocephalus. And these leads us in order to do a fenestration um, or an ETV or a combination of those. This is a rare case of the frontal arachnoid cyst combined um, uh, with a little bit of interhemispheric. And here we did an unusual approach of the eyebrow uh, and had very nice view from the frontal burr hole to the chiasm and did then opening on both sides of the chiasm in order to open um, the membrane cysts accordingly. These are the uh, fenestrations and flow voids, which you can see here and the volume reduction compared to the preoperative images. And this is our incision line just above the eyebrow. Uh, another microsurgical is the convexity um, cysts, uh, which we just fenestrate with, um, it was actually yeah, operated with an exoscope. Um, and here you can see that we just opened the membranes to the sulci um, and those uh, membranes um, opening remain to completely resolve, almost completely resolve uh, the size of the cyst by just draining the CSF now in the external CSF spaces. Our results from 116 cases um, have um, volume reduction in uh, the total of 86% of all cases. It was 78 in the sylvian fissure, uh, 79 in the uh, paraventricular or intraventricular, and uh, 77 in the posterior fossa. Since all others had 100% had volume reduction, Reoperation rate was between 0% to 22%, and 22% were the supercellar. And these are four patients, one re endoscopy, and three actually needed the VP shunt. Um, and it's very interesting to look at reoperation rates in uh, infants smaller than one year. They are significantly higher in the infants, the reoperations, and the shunt rate seems to be higher, but the numbers are too low to show significance in the study. Uh, what about complications? Our bigger cohort, four procedures um, had complications. One, one intraventricular hemorrhage, which were resolved with endoscopic lavage. One CSF leak, which was resolved uh, with a transient EVD and wound um, closure. One symptomatic sub subdural uh, hygroma um, after fenestration of an infant frontal basal um, intra, uh, intra 
uh, ventricular arachnoid cyst and this patient needed a shunt and one patient had a trauma after cyst fenestration and thereby a subdural hematoma and uh, needed an endoscopic wash out, out refenestration and EVD but this can't be uh, taken out completely. Um, so in summary uh, arachnoid cysts are mostly congenital malformations of the leptomeninges, growing usually only in the first two years of life, except the supracellular arachnoid cyst indications for surgery are hydrocephalus, mass effect related to neuro neurological symptoms, um, and relative is the mass effect in relation to maybe neuropsychological symptoms. Future surgical techniques uh, are depending on the type of arachnoid cyst and the surgeon's expertise. We uh, like to use endoscopy in the first place. Um, and the general arachnoid cysts are much more like any other uh, surgery, a risk benefit evaluation. And uh, the main emphasis is on the individual technique and the surgeon's associated risk in order to decide if we should do surgery and what kind of surgery we should use. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, it was easy for me to understand that. Uh, thank you for explaining in detail about the arachnoid cyst. I have one question to you uh, in the conclusion about the uh, uh, outcome of the, the closure rate, the reoperation re rate. Why the, uh, maybe the reoperation means the closure of the uh, stoma. Why the, uh, in smaller children is a higher the closure rate? Yeah, that's, I think, an, a question we have to ask the community, because if we look at our numbers of infants mm -hmm. uh, we are treating, they are very low. And uh, if you look at the um, individual case series, which are published in the literature, the infants per publication are also very low. So what we should do is to look at all those infants published in the literature and maybe do a combined cohort of those in order to answer the question. I think the infants are much more likely to have a hydrocephalic component uh, because they are in this dynamic phase of growing of arachnoid cysts mm -hmm. in which we see them, in which they become symptomatic and in which we treat them. And that's why they have more reoperation rate and they have a higher rate of uh, mm -hmm. risk to receive a shunt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, the, my, my data is the same as you and uh, I think so too. And uh, we have the one question in chat box uh, from the Manas in role of laser in arachnoid cysts. You use a laser? Uh, no, we don't use a laser because we don't have a laser. If we would have a laser, we would use it maybe. Um, but I think it's not a, uh, any more available on the market. Uh, not mm -hmm. a specific, at least in Germany, it's not licensed anymore because mm -hmm. the company uh, who built it was sold and they are now um, not re have not renewed the license for newer endoscopy. That's the big problem. Mm -hmm. Manas, do you have any opinion? Uh, no, means we have the thulium laser and uh, we, means arachnoid cyst as he was uh, uh, presenting in the videos that uh, it, they are thick and then sometimes difficult to cut and uh, laser uh, uh, makes it easier uh, to make it multiple punctures and then use a Fogarty to enlarge it. Uh, mm -hmm. So thulium laser has been quite useful uh, in arachnoid Rick, may, oh, Rick, may I ask you... Uh, on what occasions do you, how many times would you consider in what percentage uh, to use a, a stent? And uh, when you do use a stent, uh, uh, what is the criteria that you use? Yeah, I think a stent is always used if you think that there's a higher risk of uh, reclosure of the fenestration, which is the case in uh, infants, um, and which is the case in uh, like complicated anatomy. Uh, maybe, but we have most most of the stent actually only in infants in our series in order to mm -hmm. try to avoid uh, a second surgery. Uh, but this is also an evolutionary um, technique, which I cannot sell that we started to use stents from the very beginning. We started it later on. I think. Thank you. Okay. I, had a, I had just had a small uh, uh, comment. Do you think that the failure as infant is like equivalent to, you know, less chances of success in ETV as well? Is it really an absorption problem rather than just a premature closure? 
No, I think it's an, I don't know if it's an absorption problem, but it's, as I said, a problem within the dynamics of growth of this arachnoid cyst. So there's a complete different CSF uh, pathophysiology behind it at the time point when we do the surgery. This is the problem. Uh, and that's why, uh, why maybe if you see arachnoid cysts in infants, they're normally very big, very big cysts. Uh, if they become symptomatic. And then you see them at the time point when they would even grow bigger than this uh, if you don't, would not do surgery. So in this time point, you start to do the surgery. Uh, and this makes it maybe more likely that there are some CSF circulation disturbances beyond the existence of the cyst itself. Um, if this is an absorption problem or if this is another pathophysiological problem of, um, of the CSF, we don't know yet, I think. Mm -hmm. Pepe, how do you say about <laughs> your opinion about this issue? I agree with uh, Ulrich. I think it's mostly a problem of higher capacity of uh, newborn uh, tissue to regrowth and to uh, on newborn uh, cells uh, potential of growth and multiplication. Uh, so I, I really think this is something that is... Uh, inside the uh, potential of uh, membrane formation. Uh, I, I, I have no other explanations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Lee. Uh, maybe we much. need uh, many times to have a think about the arachnoid cyst. Uh, anyway, the arachnoid cyst is one of the best indication for the new endoscopy. Thank you, Lee. So, Stefan, can you ready? So, I, I'm trying again. I think this time it seems to work. So, uh, let me tell you some new things about navigation for neuroendoscopy. Oh. Oli Tomale has already shown us some very good examples for the cysts, but let's start off with some, some basics. So why did I come to uh, look a bit into uh, neuronavigation for endoscopy? Well, it started with some years ago when we had two cases. I present you with one 46-year-old female who showed up at night in our emergency department with a subacute hydrocephalus due to a midbrain lesion. You can see the CT scan here. Uh, it was quite an emergency because of the hydrocephalus. So uh, there was no MRI performed at that time, but it was known that she had an oligodendroglioma, long existing oligodendroglioma in the mesencephalon. So you can see the calcifications there, but obviously this grew and so she has a hydrocephalus. And there was a very experienced guy uh, on call of our uh, endoscopy group who started with uh, ventricular endoscopy at, uh, years ago. And well, something happened during that surgery. So this is the CT scan after surgery. And in effect, he never found the ventricle. Yeah, this is what his... Uh, uh, concept was on the next day. He wasn't sure why he could never find the ventricle. So he had to put a, an e, uh, EVD. And finally, we thought what happened. So obviously, he punctured the, he never punctured the ventricular wall, but he pushed the heart ependema in front of his endoscope and ended up in the contralateral thalamus. So the biggest problem with this case was that now, uh, this lady had a biothalamic lesion and remained vegetative, obviously, for the rest of her life. So in the end, this was the result. See, she needed a shunt. But of course, this is a very, very high morbidity of this uh, actually quite uh, small uh, procedure. So there was a second case, which was quite identical at the time. Again, uh, the doctor said on the next day, well, she could never find the ventricle. And so we thought we have to go dig a bit into this problem. Here's the complication rate uh, from Spiros Kuros uh, meta-analysis. It's not zero in ETV, it's five to 15%. And you can see there is not only morbidity, but there is also mortality. And this is probably due to uh, severe hemorrhage. So here's one case that happened a bit later. So if you see that down now, you will think that you will never undergo an ETV in Vienna. And after this, we thought we really always have to use navigation. So this is a 53-year-old male. Again, uh, he had an ETV by a very, very experienced person. 
in our department. The first one 12 years before, and then obviously it closed and you had new hydrocephalic symptoms. And uh, you see the endoscope was very bad uh, shape at that time. Uh, so they could not really see a lot. So they are searching now in the third ventricular floor for the right spot. Now you can see that obviously this is the basilar uh, tip uh, complex that obviously there is in front on the 11 o'clock, seems like the infundibular recess, but probably they, they really didn't know that. So finally they took uh, the Fogarty catheter and this chose this place for a, for a puncture. So you can see that they inflate now the Fogarty balloon and uh, this works obviously very well. So they inflate it, there's some hole, they decide, well, the hole is not big enough, but, you can, but we can now already say this hole is a bit off midline. Yeah, this puncture is not in the very uh, center. Uh, it's probably half a centimeter off midline. So they inflate more and more uh, to enlarge the hole for permanent. Um, yes, and you see here now uh, Kenichi's flag, which we actually never want to see in this procedure. So they immediately put external ventricular drainages, went to the NG suite. You can see here now the P1 obviously was perforated on the, on the right side. They put coils, but it was too late and this patient died uh, three hours after. So with this, I think it's enough indication to use navigation for every case of uh, ventriculostomy. So you see here, that's how we started. We used optic tracking, and I think most of us in, a, in uh, our neurosurgical departments do have optic navigation, and there are some clip-on uh, devices which you can actually clip on well, virtually every instrument. Some companies call it universal instrument adapter. And then you can, of course, track an endoscope. Well, we went for electromagnetic tracking, yeah? So you can see here that there's a magnet generating a field. Here's the patient's head still in a skull clamp. And to this clamp, we fixated uh, the patient reference tracker with electromagnetic tracking. And we did that because the electromagnetic uh, tracking provides stylets, so wires that you can put through the working channel of endoscope. And then you can really tip track the endoscope. So uh, this is how it works. Uh, the Medtronic company, for example, provides this glue-on tracker that you can put on the skin or this invasive tracker that you can screw to the bone. So we re initially realized that this is probably not accurate enough because the skin, especially in small children, moves a lot. Yeah, So you can easily have a centimeter inaccuracy. But this, of course, on the other hand, is much too invasive. So in reality, you have to create a two centimeter incision to mount this to the skull. So we thought there must be something uh, new that we have to invent. So here's the comparison to the optic tracking. Here's the stylet that compares to the pointer. And here are some, some values. You can see 0.4 millimeter inaccuracy that was measured in the lab compared to 0.1 with optic tracking. But I think still this is quite enough for us, in fact. So you can see here, this was one of our first cases. We still had the skull clamp for ETV, but honestly, I think clamping the patient in a, uh, for the for an ETV is in fact also too invasive. So we thought we need something better. So last year we published this paper on, on what we call an endonasal patient reference tracker or uh, as an abbreviation, the nasal tracker. And it should in fact uh, replace the two mobile skin adhesive tracker and the two invasive a skull screw tracker. And you can see how it works. So here is the, the tracker that you can, can buy from the company and you can remove the insides. So here is the tracker that you can take out of his rubber case. And because I like pituitary surgery, I know very well from this pituitary nasal tamponades, what size they are. And we just plug this into the tamponade yeah, until, until the tip. And then uh, here in the study, we tested uh, the accuracy between the skin tracker and the nasal tracker. Here you see the application, you take this nasal speculum, you put this in, it's very easy. And then of course you don't need a skull clamp anymore. 
you can actually uh, register the patient in supine. And once uh, you have registered him, you can move the head without any problem. You can even turn him on in, into prone position, uh, navigated. And here you see the differences. Here's the skin tracker, the glue on skin tracker. This is five millimeter inaccuracy. And here is the nasal tracker. And you can see very nicely that in fact, the nasal tracker stays, remains very, very stable and very, very accurate. Whereas here after, here you see draping, the skin tracker takes off, skin flap takes off and drilling, uh, it gets even more inaccurate. So at, with this, we uh, concluded that it's easy to apply, not in fact, not more expensive than standard electromagnetic uh, navigation. And it's very good for positioning the patient not in the skull clamp. So of course we use the electromagnetic navigation in many, many cyst uh, procedures like Uli has shown. We even use the stylet to puncture the cyst because then we can see exactly on our navigation screen where we do the hole. And I think uh, where it is most important is where the, let's say, uh, white matter is punctured because during this period, we don't see at all where our endoscope moves. And we know that the approach is not minimally invasive. It's let's say eight millimeters of a hole and we don't want to puncture twice. And this is obviously what our colleagues uh, uh, obviously had the problem with. So when they punctured the white matter, they ended up uh, below the ependema somewhere in the thalamus. And see, when we, when we use this technique, we can straight approach the premolary membrane. So I don't want to go into detail of that. So how to plan this type of surgery? So we plan it like a biopsy. We do a target point. We set the target point in this case for ETV uh, behind the dorsum and in front of the basal artery, so like the prepontine system. And then we set what we call a waypoint, so an entry point in the center of the foramen of Monroe. And then we, we extend this trajectory uh, to, the, to the head surface and then we see exactly where we have to enter. And then after we enter with the endoscope, we take the stylet and use it as a puncture device because it has a blunt tip for the membrane. And when we have this one millimeter hole, we can use the Fogarty catheter to enlarge. So here, this is from a, a recent surgery, uh, also in the middle of the night actually. Uh, so we are actually, uh, approaching you see our multimodality uh, video. So we have here our trajectory, we're moving along the trajectory and we in, in the middle of our, our image, we directly uh, have the foramen of Monroe that we can pass. And you see, if we pass along the yellow line, then we will centered uh, go through that foramen of Monroe. So here's the stylet, you can see that here's the stylet, the assistant takes the endoscope, we now enter with the, with the stylet, we puncture uh, the membrane, in this case, the premembrane membrane, so the tubal cinerium, yeah. Uh, and then we enter the Fogarty, uh, we uh, enter with the Fogarty balloon and enlarge the hole. And then at the, at the end of surgery, you see we have no contusion at all here in the fornix of the foramen of Monroe because we have uh, done, in fact, a really biopsy, uh, precise procedure. Okay, so we did a retrospective analysis some years ago and compared manually planned fixed burr hole and the navigation plan techniques for ETV. So you, you see here manually planned, many of you know this. So you measure on the MR scan and then you measure from the labella and from the midline. Uh, here's the fixed burr hole, three centimeters lateral to the satchel suture and zero, so at the coronal suture. And then here's the navigation plan. What I told you, we have a target point, prepontine system, we have a waypoint in the foramen of Monroe, and then we enlarge it up to the entry point here, the final entry point at the head, at the skull surface. And then we actually measured the position of the entry point, and then the the distance of the endoscope trajectory to the borders of the foramen of Monroe. So to the fornix here, yeah, to the thalamus on the lateral side. And then here in the third ventricle, also the thalamus into the hypothalamus. And the results are quite surprising. You see here the differences between 
manually planned and a navigation plan. So navigation plan was definitely more posterior. Yeah? So always keep in mind, of course, that there's a pre-central gyro somewhere here. So you have, don't have to go too far posterior, but it's at and even five millimeters posterior to the coronal suture. So here are the results. Again, as I told you, a bit behind the coronal suture. Here manually was more anterior to the coronal suture. And here are the results of the fornix contusion. So we never had a fornix contact uh, with a navigated procedure, but in half of the cases with a manual plan. That's a lot, that's even more than with a fixed burr hole where it was only in a quarter of the procedures. And since then, actually, we, since this publication, we are using this here as a standard procedure. Of course, we learn about different entry points. We talked about the ETV, but if you want to reach the aqueduct, we want to go more anterior, so six centimeters anterior and two centimeters lateral. Pineal cyst, even more anterior. Colloid cyst, even more lateral, to dive in shallow, just above the corded nucleus. And then here for septostomy, also more lateral. So this is what I already showed you. So that's the steps for surgical angiculostomy planning. And here is another one. How do we reach the posterior third ventricle, like in this case? So we set the target point here at the lesion. Then we set the waypoint in the foramen of Monroe. And then we generate an entry point at the skin here. And as you can see, uh, this is actually 7.5 centimeters anterior to the coronal suture and 3.5 centimeters lateral to the midline. And if you use this entry point and follow the trajectory, you will directly go through the center of the foramen of Monroe, just like an endoscopic biopsy. So recently, uh, we published this paper together with Carlos Brusius, group from Brazil. So he actually uh, had the speciality to do a single burr hole approach, so both for the posterior third ventricle uh, and for ETV, like in this case. And what he does, he measures not only our uh, ETV trajectory, but also a second trajectory to the posterior uh, part of the lesion. and then. He uh, divides this angle in the midline. It's a bit like uh, Uri Tomale has published previously. And then he knows how where he has to enter with the endoscope and how far he has to open the choroid fissure. So you see that here, and uh, you see very nicely the, the choroid fissure opened here a bit internal cerebral vein after removal of the tumor. So this is a very elegant way, I think, of a single burhole approach with still minimal invasiveness. Okay, so this is our current project. You know, the small robot that we invented here in Vienna, and we are now preparing it for the ventriculostomy or for the ventricular endoscopy cases, because it has a small joystick and it can carry the endoscope. What you can do is actually to tell the robot not to move out of a cone of security. Yeah, this is of course much too large of an extension, but using the joystick, you can create very, very fine movements and to always stay within this cone of safety. So I will keep you updated on that project. Well, to, to conclude, I can always advise you to use navigation for ventriculoscopic procedures, because I think this individual, individualized trajectory plan it can optimize the distance of the endoscope to important neurovascular structures and really uh, is, uh, increases the safety of this procedure. With this, I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, very fantastic talk. Uh, actually, I've, I've enjoyed your team's paper about the transcoidal fissure approach from the bar hole mm -hmm. with the endoscope. That is very elegant. I think so too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, someone has uh, some questions or comment? Henley, do you have any comments? No, I just want to congratulate Stefan for those nice studies you have performed. But I think, um, for example, the mistake what happened, what you showed the hemorrhage and so this will not be prevented by navigation because you see everything from the anatomy. But I agree with you, we had the same case, what you have shown that the thalamus was incidentally punctured, it was not much and was fortunate, not permanent deficit, but 
of course, the navigation gives more, more accuracy when you insert it. That is no question. That's why we always use it for all cases where it's not an ETV, but the question is then, and this is true, why are you using it not also for ETV? Because it's not, not a big deal. And I agree with for training also, it's, uh, it's I think, much better when we have the navigation also, when we mm -hmm. do an ETV. Well, you know, honestly, Henrik, I realized uh, that using the nasal tracker, what I showed you, makes the navigation very easy because of course you don't want to clamp every patient for navigation. But if you use, actually my, my, the young people here started to use the nasal tracker for all procedures. And so they do, they do even craniotomies now without skull clamping in some cases, yeah? Because the nasal tracker allows navigation in this, yeah? But it's, it's so elegant even for ETV that they just use it and they use the stylet as a puncture device, yeah? If, if I may say something, I, uh, Stefan, congratulations for your wonderful talk. And I slightly disagree. Uh, no, instead, I completely disagree with our president, Henry Schroeder. That complication that you have shown is the typical complication that would have been avoided by navigation. The most important complication in an endoscopy is wrong track at ventricular entry. That means that complication occurred because of the lack of navigation and because of a false track that entered the uh, thalamus, the contralateral thalamus. So uh, in my department, as you know, since many years, uh, navigation is mandatory in all neuroendoscopic procedure and in all ventricular catheter insertion. I know that it is expensive, but uh, problems and serious problems in uh, catheter insertion or uh, endoscope insertion are not acceptable anymore in 2021 in our country. And this is mandatory for, we are nine people who are working all together doing every kind of complex endoscopy all at the same level. And we uh, do mistakes and this is not acceptable anymore. So you have to find- Did not listen to me. I, I talked about the second case Pepe, where the perforation was made on the lateral side, where the rupture of the P2 occurred or P1 segment occurred. And this was ah, okay, okay. because you see it. And just because the bezala was uh, very prominent and close to the clivus, they made the decision to go to the other side. It's uh, for sure, if you insert it, it's a problem with the trajectory. This is, is of course, correct. Can I make a quick mm -hmm. comment? <clears throat> okay. Stefan, that was a nice paper. You know, um, I have a case that I show early in the days of transphenoidal surgery. It's really the microscopic era where a surgeon from another hospital in the LA area went through the clivus thinking it was the cella and literally biopsied the brainstem. And, you know, it just goes to show you that the use of navigation techniques. I mean, they weren't even using fluoroscopy, which is what we used to use. Um, I think is, is really sort of mandatory. Um, I would agree, should be mandatory, as Giuseppe said. Um, and, you know, it's like using the Doppler to localize the carotid arteries. We have to have all these different maneuvers to stay out of trouble. And it, it, it really just eliminates a lot of these horrific complications where you wander into critical structures. So I completely agree with the benefits of navigation. Yeah. Stefan, may I ask okay. you about, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I may ask you about the tracker, the nasal tracker, uh, mm -hmm. you obviously seem to uh, suggest that it's uh, uh, almost fail proof. It will stay where you've put it and it will not move. Uh, do you think an additional small uh, suture around it to to anchor it to the nasal is necessary or you think it'll it's, it's going to stay no no not at all also honestly off label yeah and without ethics i have been using this for years now in hundreds of cases and the only reason why i started to publish it because i realized that many of my young people started using it without telling me so they thought obviously it was a good idea yeah and so many people here 
just navigate with EM and nasal tracker, maybe clamp or not, they don't care. But they put the, put the nasal tracker, fix it on the no, either on the nose tip or on the upper lip or on the, tu on the uh, intubation tube with, with a plaster. Yeah, and that holds perfect. And we could show that actually in this in this paper. That's why we tested it for stability. You know, it's, you do it's perfect. It. Honestly, it has never <laughs> failed. Only when there's metal around it, but otherwise it never failed. And you can actually register in a supine position and turn the patient around yeah, in prone and still have navigation. You can even know how to flex the head, you know? That, so that is the advantage of AM navigation, I think. Uh, it, it does not, I mean, even if you bend it a little bit, it does not interfere. But I think uh, uh, one of the earlier cases you showed, Stefan, I am a little bit concerned about that using a clamp with uh, the uh, yeah. no, uh, the uh, tracker because uh, most of the times the clamp actually interferes with the... Uh, yeah, the you need some experience or, with yeah. that. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Next question from Manas. Okay. Yeah, um, I know. Means if I understand the uh, the evolution of uh, reducing the complication, means using a fixed burr hole uh, should have the highest complications. Then manual uh, planning, and then navigation with the least complication. But in the paper Dr. Stefan presented, uh, forty-seven percent was in in manual planning, and twenty-seven percent was in uh, fixed burr hole. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I explain why there is discrepancies there? It should have been different. well. Th this was very, this was actually a very surprising finding to us. Even you know, it was a retrospective study, so we took the last sixty cases, fifty nine cases, yeah, and they were all manually planned. None of them had a fixed burr hole, but we knew, of course, from the CT scan where the burr hole was, where they made the burr hole, and we knew where the target was. So that was the manually planned. Then, and we could compare it against the fixed burr hole, and we could compare it against our navigation plan. So it was very surprising that the fixed would have been better than the manual plan. I, I can't I can't really comment on that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Good. So thank you very much, Stefan. It's a wonderful thank talk. You. We move to the next paper. Our past president of IFNE, Professor Giuseppe Sinari. Uh, Pepe will talk about the interventricular tumor, maybe they are talk in detail about the capitron. Pepe, can you ready? Yes, sure, Pepe. I'm ready. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you to the organizer for our Indian colleagues and uh, to this uh, fantastic society on the endoscopy to talk about intraventricular tumors. I have no disclosures. Uh, we all know the limitations of uh, uh, traditional endoscopy in uh, intraventricular tumor removal. The presence of a small working channel in the endoscopes, small forceps, uh, frequently long and boring procedures due to the size and bleeding of the tumor, blurring of the vision because of the bleeding, and uh, mostly reserved for tumors below 1.5, maximum two centimeters of diameter uh, traditionally. Uh, this is the... Uh, uh, this is the, uh, uh, an old case of uh, uh, 14 years old boy that retreated more than 15 years ago, uh, pilocytic astrocytoma of the third ventricle. And uh, that was an ideal case for uh, endoscopy. We tried to do that with the traditional uh, endoscopy, as you can say. And after the first uh, elegant vision, of uh, coagulation and the first uh, biopsy. Uh, immediately after that, we started to have, of course, the typical small bleeding of the pilocytic astrocytoma inside the ventricle with the uh, frequent and rapid blurring of the vision. After three or four biopsies, you can see that uh, the vision becomes blurry and we were obliged finally to insert an uh, aspiration cannula on the side of the endoscope in order to aspirate uh, completely the tumor. The results were uh, finally very, uh, very nice in the, in the end, but the, the, certainly it was uh, not very elegant uh, under the point of view of the material that was used. This is an old, very uh, old case. Now the situation is uh, different, of course. We have now uh, something that is different, the ultrasonic aspirator for this uh, dedicated for endoscopy. It's a tool that has been um, uh, 
described by Joachim Myrtle and Gab uh, almost 10 years, more than 12, 10 years ago in 2008. They described very nicely an anatomical, uh, an animal model on uh, pig's brain and did a few uh, clinical cases, mostly on intracerebral hematoma. And then finally that uh, tool uh, fold a little bit in the uh, forgotten room uh, because of some the um, problems with the distribution of this uh, device with a small uh, German factory that was uh, uh, facing some uh, troubles in the distribution. And we started to do it uh, and to use it only in 2013, that means five years after the presentation, we have done so far uh, 30, 33 surgery in 26 pediatric cases, 24 male intraventricular, three paraventricular and six were supracellular, mostly glial tumors or craniopharyngiomas or other typical intraventricular histologies. 29 cases were treated with a pre-coronal bottle, four were parietoxypinal and one were frontal anterior bottle. Surgical technique is most important is continuous irrigation with the warm ringer lactate, keep the aspiration power as low as possible, usually between 15 and 20%. Cavitation power can be adapted to the tissue from ranging from 20 to 80%, but in some case of calcified craniopharyngiomas, we have used up to 100% of uh, cavitation power. And what is most important in the actual setting of the uh, ultrasonic aspirator, the direct control of the suction tube with the possibility of immediate clamping of the uh, suction tube in order to avoid sudden drop of intraventricular pressure. This is the device and the, the uh, GAB endoscope that is unfortunately not built anymore and not distributed anymore by a Storz company. So in the next future, uh, hopefully we will have another uh, device that is suitable for other kind of endoscopes because it will have a smaller uh, diameter of the uh, suction of the suction camera. But so far, we still have to use the old model with a GAB endoscope that is the only one that, as you can see, has basically no working channel and uh, it's the only one that allows and fits the size of this uh, uh, ultrasonic aspirator. This is the uh, aspirator as it is mounted, and this is how we use it uh, through a standard bar hole, ventricular puncture under navigation, removing of the stylet, insertion of the uh, optic, and then after the adjustment of the trajectory, insertion of the suction and the fragmentation cannula of the ultrasonic aspirator and then adaptation of the trajectory and uh, as you can see we can clamp the cannula of the aspiration and this is its use in a, a superpendinal giant cell uh, astrocytoma so uh, this is the uh, what is most important, keep suction cannula always occluded by tumor tissue to decrease the CSF aspiration. In this way, if you keep the suction cannula always occluded by the tumor, the uh, endoscopic uh, ultrasonic aspirator works nicely and uh, works fragmentating the tumor inside the cannula and uh, decreasing the CSF aspiration and decreasing the possible risks of uh, dropping uh, intraventricular pressure. In this way, when you use it uh, far away, you have irrigation that keeps the ventricular chamber uh, large, uh, then uh, by introducing the uh, suction uh, ultrasonic aspirator, keep the um, ultrasonic aspirator and cannula always occluded. In this way, you still have the irrigation fluid that keeps the ventricular chamber large and the intraventricular pressure high, so you avoid excessive drop and collapse of the uh, ventricular cavity. Then after, uh, uh, in this way, you balance the irrigation and the aspiration. Then you can progress with the tumor uh, removal and getting inside the tumor. But uh, when you remove your cannula, then you start to have a significant aspiration of fluid inside the cannula. And in this way, this is the moment of the risk. You may have an imbalance between the uh, inspiration and the uh, irrigation technique, and then you can have a, a, a drop in the intraventricular pressure and ventricular collapse. And at this time, of course, you need to restore immediately the um, balance between aspiration and irrigation, and you have to recreate a contact between the uh, cannula and the tumor, continue to aspirate uh, 
uh, inside the cannula. And in this way, the irrigation fluid can continue to keep the ventricular chamber uh, large. Tumors of the third ventricle are certainly among the uh, tumors uh, that the mostly most benefit of the tumor in uh, this uh, tool, as you can see, with very large chamber like this, and the tumor that is bulging inside the right lateral ventricle, although it has a very calcified core, as you can see in, uh, in this case, it is possible to identify the tumor very nicely immediately after entrance into the very large ventricular chamber. In this case, you were lucky because the part of the tumor that was bulging inside the lateral ventricle was almost a vascular. So we could aspirate nicely the uh, tumor from the uh, intraventricular part. That part that you can see bulging is uh, less than 50% of the tumor. And this 50% is very easy to remove. As you can see, it is very rapid and we can uh, uh, remove it also until the level of the foramen of Monroe. In this case, uh, we can continue our uh, rapid uh, removal of tumor inside the uh, ventricular chamber. You see that the bleeding is very limited because most of the blood is uh, aspirated, but then we enter into the third ventricle and here it is much more difficult because the calcified core is more difficult to remove and we have to create a small chamber and get very, very close to the tumor in order to keep the chamber uh, large and to aspirate the tumor with uh, and keeping the field clean with our irrigating uh, fluid. And as you can see, we have to work very, very close. And even the calcified core, it's uh, removed very nicely. This is the immediate post-operative MRI. You can see that the removal is excellent as well as the calcified core is removed completely and this is the postdoc. Another case of a very large intra and paraventricular tumor, this was one of our very first cases that we uh, tried to remove by endoscope because of the proximity to the corticospinal tract, as you can see in this tractography case. And also in this case, we were quite lucky because in spite of the size of the tumor that was very, very large, we were uh, facing a tumor that was uh, uh, almost uh, avascular, very soft, very friable, very nice to aspirate, as you can see with the uh, ultrasonic aspirator, with a very, very uh, easy uh, aspiration technique. And uh, uh, we were able in the two surgeries, because the first surgery allowed us an extended biopsy showing a low-grade uh, uh, real tumor, then we removed it completely in a second surgery and we were able to remove it pre open After the second procedure, we were able to remove the tumor uh, uh, completely. And uh, other cases like uh, this, for example, this uh, uh, tumor, glial tumor at the level of the foramen of Monroe, and uh, also in this case, we were able to remove it completely. This is the post-operative MRI showing that the tumor has been completely removed with a, a single bar hole technique with the uh, endoscopic aspirator. Tuberous sclerosis also is a fantastic indication for endoscopic removal. In this case, for example, we have a bilateral tumor, but the, the growing one is only on the right side. The tuberous sclerosis, we have to be very careful because the segas are very frequently very close to the thalamus veins, and very frequently the, the ventricular size is not very large because frequently we are um, uh, giving indication with the normal size ventricles just because of growing tumor in order to avoid hydrocephalus. Here we are aspirating the posterior part of the tumor that is in the uh, ventricular uh, trigon. As you can see, the ventricles are not very large, uh, but we can keep the uh, field very clean. And then when we go close to the thalamus triad vein, here we can see very nicely that we can dissect the tumor from the thalamus side vein, here we can see very nicely that if we keep our cannula far from the thalamus side vein, only the tumor will be aspirated inside of the cannula and we can keep our uh, thalamus side vein uh, um, uh, nicely. Here we can separate completely the, the tumor from the uh, foramen of Monroe. We can see that we are aspirating the last residual part attached to the caudate nucleus and uh, we are uh, now uh, in the easy part because the tumor is almost completely uh, devitalized and completely uh, deafferented of 
a vascular supply. So it is just a question of time to remove completely uh, the tumor with the uh, endoscope from the uh, frontal horn. As you can see, it's an almost um, avascular part and uh, without uh, absolutely bleeding in this part. And you can see that the, the right part of the tumor is being completely removed. Then cryopharyngiomas, cystic cryopharyngiomas, ideal indication for this uh, kind of a device. Here you can see a cystic cryopharyngioma in the third ventricle with the hydrocephalus, symptoms of intracranial pressure and the uh, smaller uh, um, uh, solid part attached to the hypothalamus. So we were obliged to use the endoventricular uh, uh, approach in this case because of uh, um, hydrocephalus and we could aspirate completely in a few seconds the uh, fluid from the uh, cystic chamber, we can uh, search the tumor that is adherent to the appendium of the third ventricle. As you can see at this point, we can uh, identify very nicely the point where the tumor is entering into the appendium, and then we can enter into the third ventricle, visualize the floor of the third ventricle, remove all the cystic part that is inside the third ventricle very nicely. Sometimes you can use very high the setting of the fragmentation power up to 80, 90, or 100%. And we were able to remove uh, close to 90% of the tumor with a small remnants in the hypothalamus that required instead um, radiotherapy uh, because of the hypothalamic infiltration. But in other cases, like in this one, for example, this much larger case than the previous one, we were uh, more lucky in this case because the tumor, in spite of the size, was not really uh, infiltrating on the side of the hypothalamus. There was also um, already a perforation, a complete perforation of the floor of the third ventricle, and the patient was uh, already presenting a um, hypopituitarism. So we, uh, after aspiration of the uh, cyst, you can uh, see very nicely the point of attachment of the cyst to the appendima of the third ventricle. Then we continue just uh, trying to remove as much tumor as possible, we realize that the tumor is uh, not really infiltrating the hypothalamus. There is just a, a, a very thin arachnoid layer below the, uh, below the cyst at the level of the tuber cinerium. So we perforate the uh, tuber cinerium at this level because it is already perforated by the tumor and we were able to remove the tumor completely only by endoscopy. And uh, this is the endoscopic approach in this case. And uh, this is the complete removal of this tumor. Uh, this is the pre-op and the post-operative of this tumor. Optic pathways gliomas as well, we can uh, do uh, uh, enlarge the biopsy and keep the ventricles um, la, uh, of normal size, avoiding the implant of a ventricular peritoneal shunt. In this case, the, uh, our target is just to remove the supra posterior part of the tumor by aspirating the part that is occluding the uh, aqueduct and the pineal recess. And you can see that going farther and farther inside the third ventricle, we can uh, aspirate this tumor that uh, even if there is some bleeding, we can keep the bleeding under control by aspirating the blood inside the aspiration cannula and uh, going farther and farther inside the third ventricle Finally, we can arrive to remove the part that is uh, anterior and posterior. This is the massa intermedia that you can see in the middle of the uh, surgical field. And we can aspirate completely the part that is occluding the uh, um, uh, Sylvian aqueduct by keeping uh, the uh, CSF circulation normal. Uh, and we can send this patient to chemotherapy uh, without implanting any ventricular peritoneal shunt. Here you can see the Sylvian aqueduct very nicely, and uh, this patient is shunt free, and we could uh, uh, treat the tumor with the uh, chemotherapy. This is the pre op and post op, as you can see, the third ventricle is completely uh, free of tumor in the uh, upper part. And uh, other cases uh, like the pre op and the post op where we are able to remove uh, more than 50 or 60 percent of the tumor. Uh, by uh, endoscopic cavity and freeing the uh, inlet of the sylvian aqueduct. And another case, the uh, pre-op uh, and the, the right side, you can see the post-op where uh, third ventricle and the upper part of the third ventricle is completely free. 
of tumor. Core plexus papilloma as well, a very nice indication. Here you can see a fantastic indication, completely located anterior to the mass intermedia. And of course, as you can see, we uh, have a very, very nice vision of these uh, kind of tumors. We coagulate the core plexus that can be disturbing during the surgery at the level of the foramen of Monroe. Then we coagulate extensively the surface of the tumor with the tulium laser. We were lucky in buying the tumor laser almost 10 years ago, and we are very happy to have it, but you can use in this case very nicely also the uh, monopolar or bipolar coagulation in order to shrink the tumor. And after shrinking the tumor, you can aspirate the tumor with a much less uh, blood loss in this case. And as you can see, uh, it's very um, easy to remove completely the tumor from inside the ventricle. And these tumor are uh, sometimes are very much vascularized, but at the end of surgery, you can remove completely the tumor and also the very small part that is uh, adherent to the uh, telacoridea can be completely removed with the uh, endoscopic cavitron. And this is the, uh, this is the pre-op and uh, this is the post-operative. And this is some uh, small clot that is inside the third ventricle, but the, the tumor was completely removed. There are alternatives to the cavitron. As you know, there is the nicomeliad. Very nice results have been obtained in the, especially in large cystic tumors. It is a mechanical, this is taken by YouTube, and uh, it is not my experience. And uh, this is a, a very nice uh, removal of a cystic tumor uh, from inside the third ventricle. Uh, this is a mechanical action of guillotine uh, at the level of, uh, uh, of the uh, aspirating tip. I don't like this kind of uh, device because it looks to me very violent if compared to the endoscopic uh, ultrasonic aspirator, but it has been demonstrated in the United States that it works very nicely. Uh, other uh, indications, uh, for example, worsening visual acuity in cystic relapse of uh, optic pathways gliomas, you can uh, open the uh, tumor cyst with the endoscopic cavitron and uh, removing the trouble at the level of the visual uh, acuity. And in other cases, for example, like in this case, another technique that is important to know, for example, this a very large case of um, ependymal uh, tumor, uh, high-grade ependymal tumor, after surgical, microsurgical removal remains this area of uh, tapestry of the level of the contralateral ventricle. We uh, prefer to use the endoscope because it was a blind spot for the microscope. So we decided to use an endoscope because it was much easier, but it was a very, very bleeding tumor. And as you can see, immediately after uh, touching the tumor with our uh, uh, endoscopic ultrasonic aspirator, the bleeding started to be so violent that we were obliged to uh, um, remove all the uh, CSF and work in a dry field using the dry field technique that was described by Gab uh, more than 10 years ago. And this dry field technique, as you can see, we are working in the air and it's very, very effective and very nice. And even if it's a very, very bleeding tumor, we were able to remove in a, a clean field and aspirate all the blood that otherwise would have made it absolutely impossible to remove uh, this tumor in a wet uh, and a fluid uh, environment, but in a, uh, dry technique, it was very, very effective. And as you can see on the postoperative MRI, the removal of the tumor was absolutely complete immediately after surgery. As a result, we had very good results. The remarks were that the procedure is easier in larger ventricle, but possible in normal ventricle under navigation control and continuous irrigation. Street control of aspiration power is of uh, utmost importance. Complication were one subdural hygroma that was treated by subdural peritoneal shunt. And in conclusion, patients harboring intraventricular tumors are in most cases ideal candidates for endoscopic biopsy or resection. Endoscopic cavity is very effective in selective indication, potential to expand indication to cure endoscopic resection. And the specific training, of course, is uh, absolutely mandatory because this is a very uh, delicate tool to use and you really need some experience, at least in animal models. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pepe. Uh, 
I'm always jealous to you、uh, because we cannot use it in Japan. So I have one simple question.、Uh, do you think is, is, is it available to use in、uh, the vascular rich ventricular tumors? So when I use a、uh, field change technique, because the one guy、uh, write in the chat how to control breathing when we are using. Using q s a r here. So maybe the, everyone wants to know how to、uh, stop the breathing in the l i m b a r a t u m a which is q s a r I think that、uh, very vascular lesion, of course,、uh, need a, a selective indication. For example, coronary plexus papilloma、mm-hmm. is a highly vascular lesion, but it is very easy to remove if you. Coagulate very nicely the,、uh, the old surrounding before entering inside with the, with the endoscopic ultrasonic respirator. But it's a lesion that has a very small pedicle attached to the t e l a c o r e o d e a or to the c o r e o plexus. So it's very easy to go around and coagulate very well the, the pedicle. But if you have a, a very、uh, infiltrative lesion, a glial lesion with a A、very extensive area of infiltration in the, in the ependema, then the vascular supply can be much more difficult to identify at the beginning of the surgery. And in these cases, you can have much more troubles, of course, in controlling、uh, the bleeding. And in this case, if the tumor is not too big, then probably the dry technique could be、uh, an option. If you want to remove it.、Uh, In a purely endoscopic environment. Otherwise, you have a cylinder, cylinder tumor surgery. You, in Japan, you are masters of、uh, cylinder tumor surgery. So, this is also another option. I still think that the, the cylinder makes、uh, a path into the white matter that is much larger if compared to an endoscope, but、uh, I have no experience in、uh, cylinder tumor surgery. I still believe that.、Uh, Uh, uh, this gab、uh, cannula is still much smaller if compared to a cylinder tumor. So,、yeah. I, still prefer the, I still prefer the pure endoscopic technique.、Mm-hmm. Thank you. So, okay, Stefan. I, I have one comment. Have you ever thought of using the CUSA as an additional monopolar, like coagulating with the tip of the CUSA, or would it not work probably because it's all metal? Yeah, I think that there will be a diffusion through the, through the endoscope as well. So it, it is my dream. It is my dream to have. When, when I first saw the, the, the soaring machine, I sent a prototype that was coupling a laser and the、uh, and, uh, and, uh, endoscope and the cavitron cannula. So you could have,、yeah. uh, because it's very thin, you know, so it, you, can, you could couple it and、uh, to have exactly coaxial. But, so the、uh, only thing. The only thing you would need is a, a shrinking tube outside,、mm-hmm. you know, as an insulation. Yeah. Outside of the, of the cavitron, and then put the monopolar on the top. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that, would be, that, would be a, that would be a solution. But uh,、okay. uh, Soaring is a, is a, it's a, it's a, small, it's a small factory, and they, of course,、uh, their research and、uh, research、uh, department is,、uh, has not all the fundings of.、Uh, Very big stuff. So they are working very nicely, but on a small project. So it's,、uh, I hope that,、okay. uh, yeah, I hope that in the future, larger, also larger、uh, factories will start to work at that. Other question? Slash? Slash, can you use it, this, this instrument in India? Uh, not all over the places.、Uh, some of、uh, the places they use it. I don't know what Manas, but it is available in, in、uh, Mumbai and、uh, people are. I'm, I'm using it, uh, but uh, we are not using it for vascular lesions. And、uh, we, we really reserve it for very low grade lesions. Yeah,、uh, I mean, so we have this,、uh, the endoscope cue, sir.、Uh, but then. There's a lot of、uh, means learning curve it needs because、uh, 
as Professor Sinali was uh, explaining, uh, if you leave it in the cavity, uh, it sucks up the fluid and then Manila has to uh, learn to, um, to press it on the tumor and then do it. Uh, so, and it's a very slow uh, process. And so we have used it, but not in many cases. And we have not, not yet mastered the art like Professor Sinali. Okay. Dr. Uh, Anand Subramaniam and Dhawal Shukla have said that they are using it in Hyderabad and uh, Bangalore respectively. Yes, <laughs> possible. We can go on to our okay. talk. So, when you're yeah, your please. Talk. I think uh, yeah, I will take uh, over to you. Yeah. Yeah, we will have uh, Domenico Solari, who is uh, currently working uh, in the Napoli Federico uh, II University. Uh, who is going to talk to us about uh, uh, craniopharyngiomas and neuroendoscopy. Is that right, Domenico? Oh, you're muted. Mm -hmm. Please unmute Dr. Uh, Solari. Okay, thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you, Professor Sankla, Professor Debujari, and Professor Kuresh. Uh, I will go. Oh, also, you have to enable my screen sharing. Can we can the screen? Is there anyone who is uh, sharing the screen? Or? No, I think uh, it's free. Are you having problem, Domenico? Uh, I uh, it is telling me that the host disabled the attendee screen sharing. Uh, I see it from my side, but uh, Manas, mm -hmm. okay, now it's working. Now it's working. Not it's working. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do not see what is on my desktop. Okay, Let, let's try. Dinesh, can you please help on technical? Sir, we we have made him co-host. Now he can share his presentation. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Sorry for this inconvenience. Okay, I think now we're set, right? Yeah, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for this invitation. As I told you, like I will bring you rapidly to the endoscopy for craniopharyngioma. Dr. Cinali already showed perfectly how to deal with craniopharyngioma in children. We have experience basically with her other two. And as Professor Capebanco already showed you, this is our city, there is the volcano, it's one of the DIID. The other one is Federico II, the Holy Emperor, and this is Diego, whom goes my tribute. And tributes goes and needs to go also to craniopharyngioma because craniopharyngioma, it is a very, very strange lesion as Janus for the Romans. He has two phases for sure, because it is claimed as a benign tumor according to WHO, but he has his own local aggressiveness and he has a variety of extremely different growth patterns inside the supracellular, intraventricular, retrocellular and many different other skull base region. And then it has an increased tendency to recur. And these are which it is now offered to us surgeons to have the craniopharyngioma treated via, via surgery, via new therapy, via radiotherapy, and so on. And just remember that you can use one of them or all of them combined several times. Recent evidence says this uh, adagio, and that the surgeon or any other uh, physician that encounter a craniopharyngioma, regardless the age of the patient uh, harboring a craniopharyngioma, has the uh, commitment to balance the treatment in between, like the delicate aggressiveness of radical uh, gross total removal and like a safe maximum allowed uh, um, removal in order then to have a juvenile treatment to complete the eradication of the tumor. So, uh, you see, uh, back in the days already, Dr. Cushing says that craniopharyngioma is one of the most forbidding lesions to treat by surgery. And then Dandy says, for the first time, agreeing with Dr. Cushing that uh, the enucleation, the complete enucleation of the tumor 
treat uh, or craniopharyngioma to uh, tumor it's quite impossible and you can only go for biopsy and try to decompress the optic and nervous system and for sure in 1945 he said the nasal route for this kind of tumor it is impractical then uh, in 1971, Dr. Hardy presented his experience, his huge experience with microscopic resection of pituitary lesions, chordoma lesion, and then he said that you can use this route, transphenoidal route, without the use of endoscopy, when the craniopharyngioma had already enlarged the cell, the patient is already hypopituitaric, there is no su supradiaphragmatic extension, and the cistern is intact at the CT scan for that time. And then again, like nine years later, Dr. Uh, Syrik said that to use a uh, transphenoidal route, you should be very virtuoso. So for many years, like when we are approaching a surgeon a craniopharyngioma, you we are used, we are familiar with this kind of classification that relates the growth pattern of the lesion. Uh, to the stock, to, to the, the pituitary stock, and to the chyms. See, this is the most famous classification coming from Dr. Yasechi. And but when things change, and then this is also like basically uh, based on the hypothalamus, and it is uh, the uh, Paris uh, Hospital Necker classification proposed by Stephanie Pouget. And it, when you are dealing with a, um, chi a child that is harboring a craniopharyngioma, then you have to mine to the hypothalamus because you have to respect the, the, the hypothalamus in order to have the possibility of uh, um, development either in terms of uh, uh, superior function of intellectus and of uh, growth in terms of uh, uh, physical. So today, already in 2014, we had like this article in a uh, work in surgery that proposed the endoscopic canonasal route to treat craniopharyngioma. In that case, we were referring to this classification proposed by Gardner and Kassam the, of the group of Pittsburgh. And you see that the tumor has its own uh, um, growth according like to the involvement of the infundibular area. So you can face a tumor that is called type one, that is pre-infundibular and you will encounter as soon as you open the uh, upper part of the cell and the Burkham cell, then you can have a tumor that involves the infundibular region and it has the stalk that offers a capsule to the tumor, and then you can have like a retroinfundibular tumor, like biting off the posterior part of the pituitary stalk. Here, there is also a fourth uh, type uh, that I cannot show you because the group of Pittsburgh recommended to not um, treat via the nose, that's the purely intraventricular craniopharyngioma. So, here there is another nice classification coming from the group of Bao, and it really, really uh, gives some correspondence in between the line of cells that are um, involved in the, uh, the, the development and growth of the tumor. And you can recognize that there is the uh, dark here, black dotted line that gives you an infradiaphragmatic craniopharyngioma, then if the line of cells starts in the anterior part of the uh, pituitary stalk, then you will have probably a lesion that stays in the pre-infundibular and infundibular area. And when you have already passed the arachnoid of the diaphragma cell with this red dotted line, you're, you have most probably encountering a tubero infundibular ventricular tumor. So, uh, this is our personal experience. We prefer to classify or at least like to uh, take our chance of removing the tumor, uh, uh, just discussing the relation at the MRI of the tumor with the third ventricle, because there is certain difference in between this small tumor and this huge tumor. The difference is the floor of the third ventricle, because when you have a tumor pushing down the floor of the third ventricle, like in this case, then you will have a huge corridor at the supracellar space to enter via the nose. And another key point are the mammillary bodies that are stay, to stay off. Uh, to be sure. And this is um, our experience together with the group of Bologna of Dr. Giorgio Frank and Ernesto Pasquini. And you see that uh, nowadays we had almost two 
1,300 procedures via the nose and 133 are craniopharyngioma. And this is what uh, we have differentiated between standard procedures that did not require the opening of the supradiaphragmatic space. And then uh, 98 procedures targeted to the supradiaphragmatic space. And you see, as we thought before, um, uh, there is a huge component like uh, at least a fifth of the procedures that have been performed for recurrent cases coming from our series or from other series. Quite a limited experience with the pediatric population is only 13 patients that has been performed also, some of them uh, along the group of Dr. Cinali. And you see, basically, sometimes children are uh, luckier than adults, and you see that 61% of tumor were subdiaphragmatic. And this is the experience of the School of Napoli, uh, dated back in 1997. We never used the endoscope. So far, we did not convert the patient, um, a procedures to transcranial. And we learned a lot from this kind of view to recognize above the posterior wall of the sphenoid sinus, which are the key landmark to expose your corridor and to recognize which are, of course, the area that you have to respect and to devascularize to access safely this tumor involving this area. And this is also a memento coming from our endocrinologist, uh, Professor Colau, that when also dealing with craniopharyngioma as any other hypothalamus hypothesis tumor, ask to have back a patient that as the most possible pituitary function. And this is what we call the standard approach. It is the same targeted to the pituitary region. It gets uh, to the cellar area um, among three major components, the nasal, the sphenoid, and the cellar step. It has been described widely by our group. And this is the first case that I'm showing you of a subdiaphragmatic a tumor, cystic component. We suspected that was initially a pituitary adenoma. Then we recognized this black spot here in T1 weighted images. So we suppose it was a calcification inside the cell. You might recognize here the pituitary gland stratified above, and this is the intraoperative video. Four hands, two surgeons working together. The endoscope is moved in and out to get the depth perception. You see the calcification that has been seen at the MRI, this is the supracellar cistern that has fallen down the, the field. Here, this is this that maybe this the capsule of the tumor. Then we are dissecting it from the, the remnant of the pituitary gland that was above. And then we cover the cistern that was breached and close at the cell as for uh, um, other procedures that require reconstruction move to the most uh, um, wonderful aspect of this surgery, and this is the extended approach. These are what we are doing nowadays, thanks to Dr. Kassam. And this is the corridor that we are using to access the wide part of craniopharyngioma that extend in the supradiaphragmatic space. You see, we remove the bone uh, of the upper part of the cella, we go laterally to both medial OCRs here, and then we extend tiny, uh, above the planum because we do not need, as in meningioma surgery, that extension that remove the dura and the attachment of the tumor. And this is a, a, um, a lab dissection picture, and it shows you a nice corridor focused on the sub-chiasmatic uh, and supra-chiasmatic with the major complex of vessel here. And this is a, a tumor. Uh, performed by this corridor, you see quite a similar opening. You immediately recognize the chiasm that, that it has not been pushed anteriorly. You can recognize the stalk. <clears throat> we are dissecting the stalk from the tumor. And then if we move with the endoscope inside the retrocellar space, you recognize the basilar. And we can also push using a suprachiasmatic corridor as a via uh, lamina terminalis. And we enter the third ventricular chamber from both sides and the vestibular respect. And of course, thereafter, you need the reconstruction. Uh, this is our policy today. We recognize hot points in every surgery. We have to clear the access corridor. We have to identify the relation of, of the tumor with chiams and vessel. And then we have to uh, respect, identify, and of course, check the function of stalk, hypothalamus, and infundibulum in every procedure. This is a uh, nice trick that we developed in, uh, in the anatomy lab. We uh, had the idea that this was not a tuberculomycin transcranial surgery. It was a notch, so we call it notch, but does not affect the anatomy. It is quite the same. Remember that we are uh, going via the nose. Then there will be some serious variant. Uh, to, there is someone who doesn't like 
these images. And you see here, there are uh, uh, different anatomical. Can you remove this line, please? This blue line, thank you. And this is what we are telling before. This is the, the main key uh, point. Okay, and then we move to the other part. And this is the supracellular notch uh, and, um, and the prefixed chiasm. It means that you will have to have your maneuverability and your corridor below the chiasm that has been pushed anteriorly down to the skull base at the level of the planum and the limbus sphenoidale. And then you have to remove the, the tumor following is major axis, but in a subchiasmatic corridor. Is this different here when you have like to work on both sides of the stalk and it is here nicely recognized and not embedded by the tumor or here it has been displaced and the tumor enters the third ventricle. Of course, this tumor may recognize, may be identified also uh, as a problem concerning like the, uh, the, the thinking that if you remove the stock and coagulate, then you will lower the recurrence rate. This is not real true. And for sure, it has been demonstrated that if you have like invasion of craniopharyngioma and you touch the uh, pituitary stalk, for sure, you will have like disaster postoperative course in terms of endocrinological outcomes. Here are some cases, like this is the case that I showed before, recurrent case, the chiasm is pushed anteriorly and you need to open here, like at the supercasmatic region, no need to extend in the upper part of the planus phenoidale. Again, this tumor, uh, this patient has been already operated transcranially and you can recognize here the Omaya catheter that has been placed in previous surgery. Then uh, there are strict adherents to the wall of third ventricle. We enter with the endoscope. You recognize the stria medullaria in the backspace of the third ventricle chamber. The floor, it has been not emitted by the tumor, gentle dissection, and then piecemeal removal as in any other tumor. And you see at the end of the tumor here, you recognize the mammillary bodies and near like a pile invasion of calcified uh, lesion. You see, this is the post-op, all the chamber has been uh, lowered down here, and that was the calcified aspect uh, at the level of the left side of ventricular chamber. Different case, type 2, you can recognize the stalk that had been enlarged by the tumor. The tumor is quite cystic, just impinging the chiasm. Here we have the stalk and the tumor uh, just invading the the, the pituitary stalk, so you, we need to open in the less vascularized part of the uh, of the stalk and then we can remove working with the two foil the two layers of the stalk and then we can enter as well via the infundibulum the third ventricle chamber respect vessels that uh, feed the chiasm and then reconstruct the procedure you see here like the pituitary stalk was completely invaded and you can recognize the two layers of the pituitary stalk nice case like it starts from the infundibular and it develops inside the ventricle, the stalk, it is again enlarged by the tumor. The cyst was fully uh, inside the third ventricle chamber. Sorry for that. Remove interior in the sake of time. And we see with the endosc endoscope, we can enter also the cyst and try to rinse out this um, cyst wall that was attached to the thalami on both sides. You can recognize adesiotalami and again, like the stream medullaris in the back part of the approach. Here, it is the wall that we did not rip off, so slightly enhancing, and the patient had radiotherapy and she's doing fine. That was finally final case of our experience that I'm showing today. The stalk and the infundibular region are anterior. You can recognize the mammillary bodies and the floor. It is uh, uh, destroyed here via the retrocellular corridor. The mass was soft. The stalk, it, uh, um, it has been split on, I'm um, sorry, displaced on one side. We can work uh, going at one side with two instruments and removing the tumor from the retrocellular space, then like off the third ventricle, and then explore again because the floor was breached. And then, of course, reconstruction. You see the floor here was interrupted, the lesion and the fat inside the. Uh, the third ventricle chamber. This is what we said that it is not recommended to do via 
the endoscopic and uh, surgery. I show you this only, uh, that was a recent case because as we told in, in that images, you can have like a nice straight, uh, decent corridor with two instruments that gets you direct there. And we did not recognize any adherence of the tumor to the third ventricle chamber. So it was very nicely removed of the infundibular and third ventricle chamber. This is a slight reminder. Again, I'm sorry for this blue line, I don't know who drew it. And these are all the cases with all the different uh, parts of the ventricle that can be involved by the tumor. This is of course seen with a 30 degree endoscope when we remove the tumor. And this is the posterior part. I showed you the floor of the third ventricle again here with adhesio, thalami, and reconstruction. But what if the patient cannot afford surgery or like you have a wide component of the tumor that uh, slides climb up into the lateral ventricles and third ventricle, then you can go from above and have the drainage of the cysts and then have radiotherapy to the patient. You see here like multilobulated uh, cyst tumor Okay, so we, we went like from tra bar hole transfrontal corridor. We do not have that nice ultrasonic aspirator that Dr. Sinali has, but we removed with our suction all the inner content of the cyst. And then we uh, had removal in a piecemeal fashion. And then we performed also other fenestration of the different cyst and performed uh, an ETV to increase the circulation of the <coughs> CSF in within the cyst. Thereafter, the patient has been well, like 30 minutes surgery with navigation. And this was the third month postoperative MRI. And we sent the patient to have adjuvant radiotherapy. Only a uh, brief reminder to the, our policy for reconstruction, mm -hmm. Professor Capabianca showed uh, before, like it is called 3F. And uh, it has been used since uh, 2017. Here it is a nice video. Most of the procedure uh, were uh, supracellular uh, transtuberculum transplantum approaches. We just slide a, a huge piece of fat, use it as a cork across the osteodural bridge. Then we ask the patient, we ask the anesthesiologist, I'm sorry, like to raise the head and to have uh, the, um, the excessive part of the fat coming out in order to have overpacking. And then we cover with the uh, flap according to the adult technique and we fill the sphenoid with different materials like this is mucoperigondrum then we can use also surgical cell or glues or whatever and then the patient stands in the, uh, the POD one so we have to study again because craniopharyngioma it is an eternal battle and this is our recent report in the uh, in this um, publication, it's called ICAR. And these are the major series. Like there is no more, uh, um, like in, back in the 80s, uh, need to remove at first shot the craniopharyngeomite. The most adequate strategy that um, it is at sea level, according to Prisma, it can be like subtotal resection, maximum allowed plus radiotherapy. Again, when you are in pediatric population, you have to uh, treat the case as adult, but respect the clinical outcome. And of course, like the major issue of craniopharyngioma, what about the stock preservation, the recurrence rate and uh, our endocrinological outcome? You see, what Neumuller says that can be used the approach, but the rates in the same group of Dr. Schwartz, it is practically the same if you go via the endoscopic endonasal corridor or transcranial approach. Still, something is boiling thanks to Dr. Brastianus from Boston, like new growth factor, new gene therapy can be defined in the next year. Some um, are already used off-label for uh, papillary uh, craniopharyngioma, but there are also other strategy like radiomics and genomics that can help preventing this terrific pathology. We have to work as a group and push the next to the level. These are some friends along the route and we prefer in Napoli like to beat sides. We are not that tall, so sometimes we climb up and escape the real problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice work, Domenico. Hey. You go ahead. Is there a question to Domenico?
you know, I don't see any questions on the chat, but. Uh, yeah, can I, I ask just, a question? Uh, sorry, my, my question is, would uh, Henry mind, or we all mind if I went next? Because we're running a little late and um, I have surgery this morning. <laughs> we do the surgery then and you you make Will you do it? Yes. What what is it? <laughs> it's a recurrent horrible glioma. Well no, then please make the lectures the next one. It's okay. Common in hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, Dan. So would you want to go with the discussion on supraorbital versus endonasal endoscopy for supracellar meningiomas then. Yes, thank you. And thank you very much to the group here for asking me. And uh, Henry, thank you for letting me jump ahead. I'm gonna share my screen here. Can you all see that? Yeah. And you can hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let me just, okay. So yes, uh, you all asked me to talk about managing tuberculum cell meningiomas, and I'm gonna talk about this topic of which way to go and a few of the nuances uh, for, for both approaches. Um, there's my disclosure coming to you from Santa Monica, California. It's a nice morning here. So uh, as the group I'm sure knows, these are a very uh, common meningiomas. They present most commonly with vision loss. They're quite a bit more common in women they often invade the optic uh, canals and they can expand and deepen the cella, which is an important component to consider uh, in the approach. There's been a lot published on tuberculum men meningiomas, particularly in the last few years on the different routes. And here's just some papers, um, including um, a nice paper from, from the Italian group in collaboration with UCSF uh, and, and others. So, a lot of work has looked at this and there's, there's um, a lot of different ways to do this. We actually published on this in 2008, um, uh, comparing the endonasal versus supraorbital route for craniopharyngiomas and tuberculum meningiomas. Um, and this was um, uh, a time when we were doing still endoscope assisted. <clears throat> we weren't going fully endoscopic. So when we look at uh, meningiomas, some of the things that we think about is um, the depth of the cella, and a deep cella is definitely one um, where in which that favors an endonasal route as shown in these images here. You can see here the tumor in this case is mostly below the level of the planum. And that in turn turns out to be an important factor. Um, as they get larger, um, you may wanna think about going from above. In these cases, almost all these cases, the optic uh, apparatus gets pushed up and posteriorly. This is one you could go endonasal or supraorbital. This is really a clinoidal meningioma, but making the point here that the optic nerve is being pushed medially by this left-sided tumor. And this is one you definitely would not want to do through an endonasal route. And then these large tumors that are really leaning <clears throat> over to the side um, and over three, three and a half centimeters in our original paper, these are ones that we thought should be done from above, either a traditional transcranial or superorbital. And so very important to consider uh, the chiasm in these approaches, consider the op optic apparatus. And as you just heard from Domenico with cranios, we mostly go um, through an endonasal route um, because of the retrochiasmal location of many of these tumors. And it really lends you reaching the long axis of the tumor um, through the nose. When we, um, I'm gonna just show you a few cases here and some of the de decision-making. So this is a 40, 46 year old woman who presented with vision loss in the fall of 2018. She had minimal light perception um, in the left eye, um, bad headaches. Interestingly, she was amenorrheic since October, 2018 and they did an MRI showing a cellar mass and she had a mild elevated prolactin level. This is her visual examination. And uh, here's her MRI <clears throat> showing a pretty traditional kind of classic looking tuberculum meningioma with some hyperostosis here um, and clear optic canal invasion uh, on the left side and significant chiasmal compression. When we did our hormonal testing, <clears throat> she was pregnant. This is a 46 year old woman with two grown children. She actually didn't know she was pregnant. She was just entering the second trimester. So um, 
the goal here is to restore her vision and to protect her pituitary gland. Um, because of the optic canal invasion, we did a uh, endonasal approach as shown here, kind of moving ahead here. So we've done the transplanum approach. We're working above the pituitary gland here. This was a tumor that was somewhat fibrous using the Doppler here to localize the, uh, the carotid artery and trying to find the infundibulum here, obviously critical to protect the infundibulum uh, given her pregnant status. Um, and you would wanna do that anyway, of course. Now working with the 30 degree endoscope coming over the top of the tumor and trying to maintain the arachnoid plane The tumor was, uh, you know, soft and fibrous as these often are. And then using uh, angled ring curettes to, to help dissect away, we've, we've really moved the, the majority of the central and the right side of the tumor. And we're really saving the, the last part after we've done an optic canal uh, decompression uh, on, the, on the left side. And we'll try to uh, tease this last part out being aware of the uh, supraclinoid uh, carotid uh, and the optic canal. I think I, I sk skipped past that part there, but the reconstruction, uh, we agree with fat <clears throat> and obviously a nasal septal flap, collagen sponge. We, we harvest the bone from the septum. This are, works very well for the reconstruction. And then we lay the nasal septal flap on the, uh, on the bone. And then we secure that with tissue glue <clears throat> and uh, Miracil tampons that are placed under direct visualization over the endoscope. This is my ENT partner, Dr. Griffiths, placing these, and this works very well. These stay in the, uh, in the nose for about five days and then they're taken out in the clinic, no lumbar drain. Um, this is her <clears throat> post-op <clears throat> showing the bone graft here, the fat graft. This is a CT scan. Here you can see the um, Miracel. Um, she could not get gadolinium because she was pregnant. Um, and she went on, uh, she did have some late onset DI, but this then resolved, had marked improvement in her vision. And this is her um, post-op six months and, and a successful delivery of the baby. Um, this is another pregnant uh, woman back from many years ago um, in which she presented uh, with at 24 weeks of pregnancy with progressive vision loss. Um, this, was, this was many years ago when we were starting to do these through the nose, but this is one because of the broad base we did through a, uh, a superorbital approach. <clears throat> Again, successful delivery. Uh, this is her MRI at two years out and we just saw her recently. She's now more than a dozen years out, her twins Twin boys are grown and doing doing well, and she has normal pituitary gland function. So these are viable approaches, um, and we we actually just published our our small I guess you could call it a series three patients of uh, meningiomas in pregnancy, tubercular meningiomas. As you all know, this is a, a common phenomenon of meningiomas growing during pregnancy. This was the third case here, but it turns out that the second trimester is really the best time to do this. It's the safest both for the, the mother and the, and the infant for the fetus. Um, and it's actually in our series, this was 7% of the women in our series of our um, tuberculum meningiomas presented in, in pregnancy. So it's uncommon, but I would say not, uh, not rare. And obviously the goal is really to save gland function and have a nice outcome for the mother and the fetus. So this is a very challenging tumor here. This is a 39 year old man with progressive vision loss. And I think what's impressive with this tumor, um, he, he has no increase in cellar depth. Um, he has a very calcified tumor, um, but he does have bilateral optic canal invasion. And because that was his main complaint and we've gotten more comfortable doing these through the nose, we, we approach this uh, through an endonasal route. And um, <clears throat> so I'll skip through some of this. Uh, this is raising the nasal septal flap. Dr. Griffiths, my ENT partner. Um, the, uh, here's the exposure again to transcellar, transplanum. 
bilateral optic canal uh, decompression, lots of copious irrigation with the uh, bit here, with the high speed high, hybrid diamond bit drill. Um, you can start to see the meningioma coming through the dura here. We're listening for the carotid. Um, this, uh, now we're doing the left optic canal decompression again with a combination of the drill and uh, small kerosens. And you can see here the calcified tumor coming through here um, and then really removing the, the planum here to reach out to this very anterior extent of the tumor. Um, and here's the two optic canals decompressed left and right. We have the carotids and then starting to open the dura here above the gland and taking a large wedge out of the tumor here. Um, and we can start to see some CSF coming. And what is um, impressive with this tumor is you can see every time we move it, the whole tumor moves. So we make a relaxing incision in the gland here to give us a little more inferior exposure. This is very helpful. Then we're, then we're peeling and sharply cutting the tumor away from the diaphragm cella. And then um, because of the, the very, uh, very strong nature of the tumor, um, we use the ultrasonic aspirator to, to start to debulk it here. Now you can just start to see the infundibulum here. Again, obviously important to preserve that and to cut the arachnoid sharply and to preserve the superior coffeeal vessels. We like to put gel foam here to avoid a lot of um, blood getting into the subarachnoid space. And here you can see this very calcified portion of the tumor, but um, coming away nicely here. Um, and then fortunately we get into some softer parts of the tumor that we can cut away once we've done the internal, internal debulking. There's the infundibulum and really trying to split the tumor right in front of the infundibulum so we can finally get a view of the chiasm. There's a, a posterior communicating right there, a membrane of Lilliquist back here. We're trying to preserve all that arachnoid and then just working through these arachnoid bands. <clears throat> and now we can finally appreciate the chiasm which is pushed posteriorly. So we're bringing that down. So now we've got, um, we know where the superior apophyseals are. We know where the infundibulum is um, and we're just peeling these pieces away uh, carefully here, and then working on this big uh, calcified, um, sort of the mushroom cap of the tumor here, uh, using a combination of sharp dissection. Now we're seeing the uh, inner hemispheric fissure here. I'll move this along. Ultimately, uh, this is a, a war of attrition with the tumor um, and getting some of this lateral tumor using the 30 and the 45 degree endoscopes to get really nice views of the optic canals. Here you can see with a 45 degree endoscope, um, decompressing the, uh, the left optic, optic nerve there out the canal and the same on the, on the right. And that's the finished uh, product. There's a superclinoid carotid there, infundibulum, and looks like a gross total tumor removal. Pituitary gland intact. So same, same reconstruction, fat, uh, collagen, uh, bone graft, and a nasal septal flap. So there we go. So this is his post-op, a big fat graft, <laughs> quite large. You can see the gland there. He's gone on to do very well. Vision's improved. Um, this is a fairly recent case, has done well. So let me just talk about the superorbital approach. We, we consider this the, the sweet spot of the frontotemporal craniotomy and really gives you nice retractorless entry uh, into the floor of the frontal fossa, paracellar, parasylvan areas, and really endoscopy is quite helpful. We use this for a lot of cases, um, particularly for a lot of meningiomas as shown here, both from the olfactory groove all the way back to the tuberculum cella. Uh, and even some uh, convexity meningiomas if they're not too far away from the, from the side of the incision. We always set the room up uh, ready to use endoscopy. The positioning is like for a traditional terional craniotomy and we have it set up so we can easily bring in the endoscope and you, with an assistant you can have two-handed microdissection. Um, some of the nuances of the approach, and this was, we just published this not too long ago, it's our series here, this incision through the eyebrow, 
um, right through the mid thickness of the eyebrow, taking it right up to the edge of the supraorbital nerve. Um, the burr hole goes just below the superior temporal line. Um, one, of the, one of the variations that we've made, one, an important point here is you really wanna get as high as you can so that you can utilize your instruments effectively, identify the supraorbital nerve here. And this is really uh, all the exposure you need. Um, this is a sort of an old exposure showing how we used to take the pericranial flap. We've changed that now in order to <clears throat> protect the branches um, of, the, of the facial nerve that come up like this. And so um, this is a little bit of a modification. Really the idea is to preserve these nerves that come up um, and innervate the, uh, the frontalis. So instead of doing the incision like this looping up, we do the pericranial incision like this a little lower and then we tee it up right uh, just lateral to the supraorbital nerve. And this generally uh, preserves um, the, the forehead uh, musculature, although they may be weak um, and also preserves uh, sensation. So that's the approach there. And this is uh, just an image from the paper that we did um, that just came out um, a few months ago. And the, you can see the, the nice healing that you typically get. So this is a case, this little clinoidal meningioma um, where you, you definitely wouldn't wanna do this through the nose. Um, and this case just kind of shows a little bit how we do the approach um, for those of you that haven't done it. Um, it's a very nice, uh, simple approach. Here's the supraorbital nerve bundle. So we're cutting that, this is the left eyebrow um, so we're cutting just lateral to that and doing this pericranial cuff, then lifting all this up. And they're gonna put our, our single burr hole just below the superior temporal line right there. So I'll just move this along here. Um, no, no retractors are needed. Um, here we're just opening the, the dura in the usual way and we come right down on the meningioma as soon as we identify the olfactory junction with the optic going past the tumor here and opening um, the cistern to, for brain relaxation. And this is a small tumor um, and we're just peeling it down um, from the clinoid region here uh, and, the, and the posterior planum and again, putting gel foam into the subarachnoid space so that all this blood doesn't go into the subarachnoid space. And you can see no retractor, three hands are working, um, you know, with the assistant uh, helping grab, grab tumor. And you can see the nerve here, very um, distorted by the tumor, very lifted up. And as we go further, you can see that it's extremely um, adherent and we're not gonna be able to get the whole thing out um, without uh, probably injuring the nerve. So in this case, we did not open um, the false form ligament even, um, but we did um, get right up to it. And then we bring in the endoscope to get a better view here. Uh, and you can see this here, working with a 30 degree endoscope with an assistant holding and trying to elevate this tumor away from the nerve. And most of it comes away, but some of it is just too, too adherent and we, um, we settled for a, a near, complete, near complete removal. And this is a case where, you know, really the goal here is to restore vision. I think if you go too hard, you can certainly um, hurt, hurt someone's vision. And this is the closure. And I'm just gonna move along here. She ended up doing very well, vision got better. She did have a regrowth slowly over time that we treated with stereotactic radiotherapy and she's done extremely well. But you can use this approach for very large meningiomas. This one, we actually didn't use the endoscope because we had such a large cavity. And so this was, this was um, through a left supraorbital approach, um, perfectly uh, approachable with um, this uh, keyhole concept. So here's just um, two examples from a recent paper. And um, I think, I'm not sure if we have time to show the video here, but so this is an, in, let me just go back here. This is a case where we would go endonasal because the tumor is invading um, the left optic canal. This was a large one um, with some optic canal invasion, but so large we did a superorbital approach. And um, I'll just, um, 
I'm just going to show the optic canal decompression on this case, this smaller meningioma here. I'll move to the to the end here. And again, because the optic canal invasion is on the left, we remove all the tumor. First, we obviously decompress the canal. We remove the easy part of the tumor on the other side, again, protecting the infundibulum, chiasm, and the tumor here gets, gets quite firm. But again, with the angled endoscope, you can see us working over the carotid here and sharply cutting this away, being uh, cognizant of the um, ophthalmic artery uh, and the supraclinoid carotid there. And again, sharply opening the canal here to try and really get a complete removal of, of tumor out of the canal. And then I just wanna show this larger, um, larger meningioma with bilateral optic canal invasion. We just thought it was too big to do from below. And um, he had a significant visual deficit, um, worse on the right than the left. So we wanted to do bilateral optic canal invasion, which is very hard to do through an eyebrow. Um, whoop, I think I went, let's see here. Oh, that's the instant, here we go. I'll skip this. What I wanna show you here is the utility of the endoscope. We use the, um, in this case, uh, this uh, flexible endoscope. I'm uh, blanking on the name of the endoscope, but it allows you to, um, it's a rigid endoscope with a flexible tip. And um, this was progressively moved, a case I did with my partner, Dr. Barkadarian. So you can see we have pretty good view. Um, this is coming from the right side. This is the right optic nerve here. The chiasm is here. We're removing tumor from the planum here. Um, and we're gonna bring uh, the endoscope in. So there's the contralateral optic nerve. And now we're coming in with the endoscope <clears throat> and we can see the two optic nerves. <clears throat> and now uh, we, we're actually with the angled endoscope, we're actually able to remove the um, meningioma from both optic canals under um, direct visualization. Fortunately, the tumor was soft and this allowed us to um, remove those. So um, the beauty of endoscopy um, for these cases um, so this is our series. This is actually uh, in press now in operative neurosurgery. So 33 patients, 91% women. This is over about a 12 year period. We did 61% through the nose and 39% through the eyebrow. It's actually a flipped ratio compared to our earlier experience. And you can see the deciding factors for endonasal were basically a smaller tumor volume, smaller diameter, less lateral extension and a smaller amount going below or going above the planum. And they had a deeper cella and a sharper angle of the, of the tuberculum, more acute. And those were very significant factors of choosing which approach. Um, extended resection was basically the same about 97% for both approaches, 96, 97 gross total if you go by strict gross total, 80% um, in endonasal, 39% gross total. We did optic canal decompression in three quarters of the uh, endonasal approach, but only 8% of the superorbital. And we had a similar rate of vision improvement. And the endoscope was very helpful in four, at least four of the 10 cases. Um, we saw post-operative uh, flare changes in only two patients in the whole uh, group. This is again, one of the strengths of the endonasal route without any need for, for retraction and um, no major um, you know, systemic complications. Um, one CSF leak, one vision decline, one stroke, one hematoma. And again, this is just showing these flare changes or lack thereof for the um, supraorbital approaches. And I think it's a, it's a great approach for that. Um, this is again, just showing this uh, large patient I just showed you here, minimal flare change after that long surgery for this very big tumor. So a real strength. And this just shows our trend over time. If we include some of the original cases we presented in that paper from 2009, you can see that our ratio of endonasal endoscopic has gone up significantly um, and particularly in the last um, 
five years. So we really like this approach um, for uh, tumors that have the majority of the tumor below the planum. They have this more acute tuberculum angle, minimal lateral extension, that's an important concept. Um, and, um, but certainly if they have optic canal invasion, the endonasal approach is, is favored for that. For the superorbital, it's the larger tumors, if the majority of the tumors above the planum, um, and if they have lateral extension. Uh, so it's, it's very surgeon dependent. It's, you've got to look at your experience. Um, for your um, tumors with similar portion of tumor above and below the planum, you can really go either way. But if again, if there's medial optic canal invasion, we, we certainly favor the endonasal approach. And with that, um, I thank you all for your attention. Happy to answer any questions if, if you have any. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Dan. That was uh, beautifully demonstrated. There's a there's a there's a question on the on the chat uh, or a comment uh, that says a vision improvement is not dependent upon optic canal decompression. What's your comment on that? Well, I think, I think it probably is. I mean, I think that um, it depends on, on the cause. You know, so in some cases, you know, the, the vision improvement is a chiasmal improvement. So whether you come from above or below, if you decompress the chiasm and you don't devascularize it, you should have improvement in your hemianopsia. If you have an optic nerve um, deficit from optic canal invasion, um, particularly if it's medial, I think you have a better chance. And certainly the data out there, when we looked in, in that paper, we review the data. When you look at the data um, of going from above versus below, the visual data is clearly better going from below. And I think that's because you have this opportunity to do 180 degree um, uh, decompression of the optic canals medially. Um, and, and it's hard to do it's hard to do even with any transcranial approach. I mean, if you did a bifrontal, you could you could do it. We're working on it more for the superorbital, but I, I just think you have a better, it's a better anatomical approach from below. Thanks. And I noticed, uh, Dan, that uh, in the superorbital, you didn't use uh, a cavitron. Is that personal choice or is it just it wasn't included in the video? It just wasn't included in the video. We, we use the ultrasonic aspirator for, for many of these cases, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. Great. Sure. May I congratulate with Dan? It's a very hey, Paolo. Dan. Uh, it's a very beautiful comparison. It's very interesting the, the way you have worked along these years and also the details you have analyzed. It's very interesting. Uh, sincerely, not because we are friends, but I really want to congratulate with you because uh, there is a uh, Teutonic method to analyze this, which permits to um, try to understand. It's not conclusive what you say, but gives the possibility to understand what we are doing. M very, very beautiful. Congratulations. Thanks, Sorry. Paolo. Well, I think, um, you know, when uh, some of this goes back to when Felice was with us, um, back in the, my early days at UCLA, and, you know, we were doing the endonasal with an endoscope assisted the trend shows in that last graph, we've gotten much more comfortable doing this from below and think it's a better approach for the majority, 60% or so of at least the ones we see. Um, you know, if you're seeing all tuberculum meningiomas that are four and five centimeters, you may need to do most of those through a craniotomy. But I think we have better reconstruction with the nasal septal flap and we have a better way to decompress the optic canals now from below. So if with those two factors, um, I think it's a, it's a better approach for the right size tumor. No, so. it's, for me, it's important what I understand from your work, that it's so important to respect the vascularization of the chiasm because, because of all the, 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 the problems we get, uh, it's when you, um, there is a vasospasm or you, you get yeah. a tiny vessel bleeding and you have a result that's not satisfactory, satisfying as you expect. 
So it's very, very interesting, your paper. N not to conclude anything, but I was impressed. Very interesting. Congratulations again. Suresh, you have a comment? Suresh and then Henry? Yeah, then very uh, uh, excellent presentation. And you made so many points so clear uh, mm -hmm. to all of us. Uh, my question is that, you know, the vascular uh, relationship, intracranial vascular relationship, particularly the, the ACAs and ACOM perforators, uh, with the tumor, uh, whether they are attached to the tumor or embedded within the tumor, encased by the tumor. Uh, that is uh, also a very significant uh, point uh, when you're deciding the approach, endonasal versus uh, transcranial. That's a very good question. You know, um, I had a case in there that I, I didn't show um, that I took out for time, but um, as you know, many of these tumors get encased they encase the anterior cerebral complex to varying degree. And, um, you know, I, you have to deal with that either way, whether you come from above or below. And I, I think that um, we've gotten more comfortable doing it from below. The one thing that we do use all the time is the Doppler. And because if you, if you decompress, if you shell the tumor, you know, you internally decompress and you have a rind that is still got the vessel attached on the dark side of the moon, so to speak. You can't see that vessel very well. You don't know where it is. And so we use the Doppler to really map that out as we're getting to that final cuff. And, you know, in some cases we end up leaving a tiny remnant um, of tumor stuck on the vessel. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think it's, it, I still think the most important thing with these tumors is the vision status in most cases. So you, if you're comfortable doing it both ways, you should pick the approach that gives the highest chance for visual recovery. Um, and I, I think with the vascular encasement, you know, whether you, ha you have to deal with that from above or below either way. And I, I think that uh, that's sort of a comfort level, but we, we don't decide too much based on that. But I guess the, the point is also the bigger tumors are more likely to have encasement. And those are ones that you're more, more likely to do a craniotomy on anyway, I suppose. So, good question. Thank you, thank you. Henry, you had, a, you, had, you had raised your hand, Henry. Yeah, Dan, thank you for this nice presentation. I completely agree that there are indications for endonasal and there are also indications for transcranial surgery, especially if you have this steep tuberculum cellae and the tumor goes far down into the cellar, then of course endonasal is much better. But on the other hand, I'm still in most cases in favor of the uh, transcranial approach and meningiomas because they are sometimes going more lateral than you expect. So you have several cases when you open up, you make an eyebrow approach and you see the tumor is not only in this area where you see it on the MRI, but it grows on plaque more laterally. And this will be clearly overlooked from the endonasal approach. The second thing I had to experience that one very abnormal superior hypophyseal artery was arising from one side and traveling through the tumor and supplying the whole chiasma. So on the other side was not a similar vessel, was an, an anomaly, but just one big vessel. And I had to dissect it, it was in the tumor. And I, I found it easier for me. Of course, you can say you can do it from below as well, but I think I recognized the vessel earlier than I would have recognized it from the internet, but what you said is true. It is on the dark side of the moon because usually the vessels are pushed up by the tumor and you see it late. So I think in this particular case, there was a, would be a high risk that I damage it. And then the next thing, uh, what I want to mention is the case, what you showed with this calcification. I had a similar lady from Cairo and there was no arachnoid plane at all. All the small vessels from the superhypophyseal artery were completely in the tumor. And I Ooh. had to cut with scissors and dissect. I, I really was afraid I make her blind. She had a visual deterioration, but she was not, not blind. But this was a nightmare. And I think it would be hard to do it endonasally. That's why in my opinion, if I see that there is a post fixed chiasm, so it was pushed in the back, I have a lot mm. of space to go in. I usually prefer the eyebrow and uh, you have nicely shown the problem is if you have bilateral infiltration of the optic canal, then it is the ipsilateral canal is a problem, but you have nicely shown that you can do it with an endoscope. If it's the only unilateral invasion of optic canal, then I come from the contralateral side because you can look yeah. nicely into it. 
Yeah, those are those are all great points. I, I mean, you know, th there's a lot of discussion about the Simpson grade too, and with the with the Indonesial approach, it's hard to, <clears throat> you know, achieve achieve that highest grade <clears throat> resection. Um, I, again, I, I think we've just gotten more comfortable doing it from below. I was very, very concerned with that calcified tumor. I, I thought this could be a terrible mistake <laughs> to do yeah, this. It was very brave. Fortunately, <clears throat> fortunately, the outside of the tumor was soft enough and it had not totally invaded all the arachnoid planes as you could see. So, yeah. you know, sometimes you just, you get lucky, I think. Um, but uh, in terms of the superior apophyseals, I think, they can be hard to find in the <clears throat> in the endonasal approach for a, for a meningioma. They tend to get pushed back with the with the tumor, which so you find them kind of late, as I showed in that in that case. Um, but for example, with cranial pharyngiomas, they often will drag one superior apophyseal all the way to the other side. I mean, I've seen that a few times. As soon as you open the dura with the cranial, the superior apophyseal from one side is coming across. So it. These are these are tough tough tumors. There's a there. It's a high rent district, and there's so many ways to screw it up. Um, but I think these are two good approaches, and you have to just be comfortable um, with, you know, the one that you the one that you use the most. I think, and good decision making. So there's a question here asking what is the duration of time for between. Uh, or similar sized tumors, uh, is there a difference, significant difference? I suppose it depends on the learning curve, but at your level, you'd be equally comfortable doing both. So there's a question here, is there a difference in the duration of time to do either of the procedures? I don't, you know, I think the endonasal approach is probably a little longer because of the nasal septal flap, <clears throat> the reconstruction. I blame that on my ENT colleague, Dr. Griffiths, you know, <laughs> No, he, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, I think the endonasals are probably a little bit longer um, because of that. The reconstruction, the, the, all the things associated with reconstruction take a little bit longer and the drilling takes longer. You know, the superorbital flap, you know, doing that takes 15 minutes to get basically to get the bone open in most cases, 15, 20 minutes. Um, so it, it depends so much, I think on the texture of the tumor um, and the size and, you know, how stuck it is. Um, I mean, you can spend a lot of time peeling a tumor away from, you know, the, the um, circular Willis vessels. Um, but I'd say in general, the endonasals are probably a little quicker. I don't know if the others would agree with me, um, Henry. Uh, yeah, I think so. But I think this is not a major point. No. The yeah. outcome is clearly... Uh, I think the most important fact where we have to deal with. And there, I, I know as there are many studies say that the endonasal is better, but I think the nature of the tumor is determining the outcome more. If you have this tumor, which is so ugly, infiltrating even the optic chiasm, I had a case yeah. with no plane, the tumor was invading the chiasm, then of course you will have a bad outcome or you have to stop very early to leave tumor behind. Although that is rare, it can happen. And then this, I think, this is a, a major point. I think you can get a good, you can good, you can get a good visual outcome from both approaches. And you have still, you have shown it in your series. You have the same visual improvement rate yeah. if you compare endonasal and cranial. Well, I had one case early in the superorbital series where we we had a, a really bad visual outcome in one patient. And he, he was from out of the country. It was a very unfortunate case. He, he, got, he got better in his, in his bad eye, but in his good eye on the ipsilateral side, I just tried too hard to get the tumor away from the nerve. And it was a good lesson. I mean, it was a, a bad lesson, but one I never forgot because he, he went to no light perception in that eye. He still has no light perception. I still see him. He's very thankful because his other side of vision is good. His chiasmal vision is, is good. But I just tried too hard. And I think as I showed in that case, the first case I showed um, where we showed or the endoscopic assistance through the eyebrow, the tumor was just too stuck to the nerve, in my opinion, to try and peel it completely off. And, you know, the lady presented with vision loss, why make it worse when you have a good option with stereotactic radiotherapy? 
And I think that's one of the key things with these is knowing when to stop and not over manipulating the nerves because they, they don't take a lot of manipulation. So I think that's a really important point. Yeah. There's someone who's asking a generic question says, what's the advantage of the supraorbital over the conventional tyrional approach? What's your response to that and or anyone else? Well, I, I mean, I would say the, the, it's, it's easier on the patient. It's less muscle, tissue, bone, brain exposure. You don't need a retractor. It puts you right on the floor of the frontal fossa. There's absolutely no need for a retractor. Um, and uh, it gives you all the view you need. <clears throat> Once you open the cisterns and you have a good view, you know, you, you have good an neuroanesthesia, you just don't need those big approaches. We just don't, we don't use them anymore um, <clears throat> for, you know, occasionally, but for this, this disease, we, we don't, we don't use a traditional terional or a bifrontal. Right. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Moody, there is a question, there is a comment in uh, the question box uh, yeah. by uh, Manas himself. He is a great advocate of the contralateral supraorbital approach. Would you like to say something, uh, uh, Manas, uh, as the last comment, maybe? Yeah, no, means, uh, as, yeah, I'm there. as uh, Professor Henry explained that the vision outcome, uh, whether you do a transcranial or a transnasal has been similar. And rather, if one does a contralateral approach, uh, for smaller tumors, uh, especially in endoscope, you directly see, we don't, with a zero degree, you don't have to use a 30 degree and, and devascularize and, and remove the tumor without manipulating the nerve. So take, uh, in our experience, using a contralateral approach for smaller tumors, our visual outcome has been better. The fact that you, when you get a tumor, your first approach has been a trans nasal approach and but with that approach, half of the cases you had to do a transcranial, like 60 and 40 percent. 60 percent of the time you have done a transnasal, 40 percent transcranial. So and come and with a similar visual outcome, and with the additional disadvantage of having CSF leak. So if doing a contralateral approach, uh, or means takes all the advantage of transnasal approach and. And, and the advantage of transcranial approach. So if I look, my first option is transcranial, I get, I think there are very few indications of transnasal. So you prefer the contralateral transcranial if you have a, an, an optic canal invasion on the other yeah, side? Because bo both, most of the tumors in meningiomas, they do, not, they do not have an attachment in the midline. They have, they, I mean, so mo almost all of them are either on the right or paramedian, either on the right or left. And the visual mm -hmm. loss depends on the site of the attachment of the tumor. So we try to operate a tumor on the contralateral to the side of visual loss in smaller tumors. When, uh, means as you showed you many of the MRIs, the tumor is, is paramedian. Only in few cases, it's midline. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I think that's a reasonable approach. If you know and you're having my results. experience of the cases we had operated, I had three cases. Uh, we found incidental paraclinal aneurysms at the end of decompressing the tumor, uh, which Dr. Dev Pujari was not believing. But last week he he gave he gave <laughs> sent me a message that he found a paraclinal aneurysm. So in three of them we had to clip it. So I, I did I a five centimeter tumor and I found an aneurysm underlying that. So. That was a bit of a surprise, uh, I guess. And I'm sure in the transnasal, if you find an aneurysm, it, you, you may not think of doing a clipping, uh, but rather, again, go for a second procedure of coiling or a transcranial approach. So, and uh, all of us know that there are satellite nodules in the dura at least two centimeter or four centimeter from the site of attachment. And in transnasal, we do not address to that. Uh, satellite nodules. So logically, and it has been systemic in meta-analysis, they have uh, published also that the incidence of recurrence has been higher in transnasal approaches. Hmm. Interesting yeah, I... question. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, any comments to that before we then move on to the president of the IFNE, Henry, to give his talk on colloid cysts? Bad luck with his glioma. <laughs> ah, Henry, thank you. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Dan, for your talk and uh, uh, your time. I'll listen in for a few more minutes and I'm going to have to leave. I'm so sorry, but it's been great joining you all. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Henry, all yours. Take it from there. Yeah, first I want to thank you two for the invitation, Chandra and Moody and all the Indian friends. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, Chandra gave me the topic, endoscopic resection of colloid cysts. This, I, was, I was a consultant to Karl Storz. This year I'm not a consultant. They have no consultant contracts because they don't sell anything in Europe. You know that? So I think colloid cysts are a very good indication for endoscopic surgery. And I like it very much, but the question is, are we radical enough? Is it a safe technique or it's it unsafe? Should we make it microsurgically with endoscope assistance? So there is a lot of concern in many from my colleagues and many have tried endoscopy and then finally they gave up because they said, no, it's nonsense. It's too risky. It, it, it takes a long time. There's always a lot of bleeding. So that's why I just want to present uh, my experience. So the appearance of the colloid cysts is very variable and we have to adapt our technique according to the cyst what we see. So the indication for colloid cysts I think is pretty clear are all symptomatic cysts. I think there's no doubt but if I see an asymptomatic cyst with ventricular dilation, I usually advise for surgery, especially in younger patients. If I see a small cyst with no ventricular dilation, then we advise for observation, especially in older people. And I have many patients in my clinic, which I follow for more than 10 years and there's no growth of the cyst. Sudden death is a problem in some cases, but you should not force a patient for surgery just you, because you want to make a surgery and say to him, you are a high risk to have a sudden death. But in younger patients, it can happen. And some many years ago, I made a literature research and I found the younger the patients, the shorter the duration of the symptoms. So some patients have a history of just one day. I don't know whether this is really true or the kids did not report it to the parents and they don't know. But it's very variable the uh, time from the beginning of the problems and the herniation. So I have seen two patients with a sudden death. It was a 19 year old girl, four months history of headache. And the doctor said it's related to her period. And then she came in fixed dilated with this image. And another case was a 30 year old male. He was complaining of headache for five months. And then at the morning when he came to our department, he had a car accident, but no, no major injuries. And he requested to go home because he's feeling well. There was no um, brain uh, contusion or brain commotion. There was nothing. And then three days, uh, three hours later, he came back also in a comatose state. He had a headache, vomiting, a seizure, and then he herniated. So obviously the small minor head injury was initiating this deterioration. And you know, there are a lot of reports about colloid cysts, especially the early reports in the end of the 20th century. They say there is no possibility to have a gross total resection of the wall, but just evacuation of the cyst. Of course, there are now more papers, but the question is still, is a safe endoscopic total resection possible? And we have changed the technique in the colloid cyst. We added more sharp dissections. The borehole is more anterolateral. We use a bimanual technique. We retract, for, uh, for example, the uh, fornix with the endoscopic trocar. We have a small chamber irrigation technique and the dry field technique. All this can be used. So first, the borehole, what we had initially was a standard pre borehole, what we used for an ETV. But you see it's a tangential view to the cyst because we see to the floor of a cyst, but not to the roof of the third ventricle where it's attached to that, that is not good. 
So nowadays we make a borehole far laterally. We always use navigation for that. We just want to slide over the head of the collet nucleus and we go far to the forehead, usually behind the hairline because of cosmetic reasons. But if, if we have a patient with a bald head, we take a wrinkle. And you see now we have a much better view to the colloid cyst. The only exception is if we have a cavum and a septum pellucidum, we can go from this uh, pre coronal borehole and we go into the cavum. This is one example. You see the cyst is pushing the fornix down. If you come through the foramen, you might damage your fornix. It's better you open up here the septum and then you can go on top of the cyst because one fornix is on that side and the other one on this side. And then you just open here and you have a good access to the colloid cyst. So we have to look to the images. What equipment do we need? I think we need an endoscope with a large working channel. This working channel is three millimeters in diameter. That is very important because we want to invert uh, a large um, suction tube. That is a major problem. We have this Chaillet 8 suction tube is 2.7 millimeters. It's fitting through the three, uh, 2.9 millimeter working channel. And we have a big syringe for aspiration. And then of course, an endoscope holder is very helpful. I don't like it if I have a tree hand and my assisting is holding endoscope because sometimes we go into the foramen of Monroe, we have to lift up the fornix. And if you make unintentional movements, you can cause damage to the fornix and this should be avoided. And of course you need a good camera with a high resolution. And I'm still in favor of a standard HD camera, I don't like the 4K. I think the color fidelity is not so good. Resolution is not so good. So I'm still a fan of the image one uh, HD camera. Hemostasis technique, it's important. We use the bipolar electrode and the bipolar forceps. And one of our fellows has termed our technique for using the endoscopic sheath and the irrigation, the small chamber irrigation technique. And that means if there is some hemorrhage, we start with forced irrigation and we, tr we try to go close to the bleeding source. And then we withdraw the endoscope five millimeters into the sheath. And this creates a small chamber. And because this small chamber can be easily cleaned with irrigation, um, uh, this um, is a nice technique because we bring the edge of the sheath close to the bleeding source and then we start force irrigation and you have a clear view here. So that's why it's called small chamber irrigation technique. It's one example, it's a colloid cyst, a bimanual technique to see the pedicle of the cyst. And the pedicle has an artery which comes from the telechoroidea. And to get access to the artery, I have to pull with a second instrument and then I coagulate. I coagulated several times this small artery and I thought this should be enough. But I was wrong, I cut the artery and oops, it starts to bleed and you see immediately, although it's a small vessel, the vision becomes blurred. So what can we do? We start of course irrigation with our syringe and then we have a glimpse of the anatomy and I go very close with my endoscopic sheath. And then I go back into the sheath to have here the small chamber. And this can be cleared with forced irrigation. And then I go into the third ventricle and then I have to elevate the fornix, but you see this is a small chamber here. It's clean, clear view. And then I have to get access to the telechoroidea where the artery is coming from. And so I have to retract the fornix a little bit with my endoscopic sheath. Mm. And then I get access and I can coagulate the small artery. So I think it's a very helpful technique. And then we can continue with our, our surgery. The dry field technique is already mentioned by Pepe. This is a technique which we use also for a long time, especially when you have a hemorrhage which cannot be controlled with irrigation. So sometimes you have severe hemorrhage and if you start to irrigate, you know it takes 20 minutes or half an hour and will not become clear. And then the uh, dry fit technique is very nice. We first described it in 2002 in the paper about our 
colloid cysts. And then Joachim from Hamburg uh, put five cases together or six cases together where we used it also. And here's an example. This was a misunderstanding between me and my assistant. He should rotate the endoscope, but he additionally pulled. And you see, we had a hemorrhage from the telechoridia from a vein. And this is really the Japanese flag. You don't see anything. And what you do then is to start again with irrigation. But you see, there's no chance. It will not become clear. And that's why we use a suction tube and aspirate the bloody CSF. And in all of our cases where we use that technique, the hemorrhage stopped spontaneously. So we didn't find the bleeding vessel. It just stopped by removing the CSF. And usually we fill then the space again with CSF because there is a collapse of the ventricles and you don't have enough space. But it's quite a useful technique. And you see, although we had this hemorrhage two times, the first hemorrhage was also in this patient. You see there's no damage to the fornix. So you can control it with an endoscopic technique. We have flexible forceps because we want to use a bimanual technique. That means the flexible forceps is introduced by the side channel and the side channel is angulated. The main instrument comes via the straight working channel. And that's very helpful. You can pull on the cyst and then you can cut, especially when you want to get access to the pedicle. This is very important. This is the position of the head with sharp fixation. And you see we use here a lateral far anterior located entry point in the wrinkle. Navigation is used to have a good access into the ventricle. So mainly it's used to locate the bohol at the right place to get access to the ventricles, then all is done after or according to the endoscopic view. This is our setup in the room. Here you see one example it was a young man with headache, sometimes nausea, and you see the dilation of the left ventricle. You see the cyst is more apparent in the left for Raymond, then of course we come from the left side. Navigation used, and we go in. You see, this is the ideal case. The cyst is very apparent in the foramen. There is no core plexus covering it. We open the cyst. It's a very liquid content, very easy to aspirate. It takes just a few seconds and the cyst is empty. And then you see the cyst is almost surrendering immediately after evacuation. Then, of course, we have to get the pedicle of the cyst, regulation of the plexus a little bit, and then we grasp it with one forceps, and then we take another forceps. And then you see in this case, there is no vessel in the pedicle. So this is a very lucky case. You see, there is just a fibrous band from the telechoridia, but there is no the typical vascularized pedicle, what we see frequently. So if you see this, this case, you think, wow, colloid cysts and are always easy, but that is of course not, not the case. In this case, we just pull the cyst, no hemorrhage, everything is fine. So, and post-op patient was doing well. You see it's another cyst, you see the content is a little bit more dark in the T2 weighted imaging, indicating that the content might be more firm. Symmetrical size of the ventricles for Raymond left, right the same. So then we come from the right side. See the septal vein, thalamus dried vein, the fornix running here. The first step is coagulation of the core plexus, which is covering the cyst. We open the cyst and then we try to aspirate. You see the content it's really colloid, so it's not so nice like in the first case. Then we have to mobilize the cyst into the lateral ventricle. And you see there's a lot of core plexus attached. And here is a firm part, which is not so easy to aspirate. And this is now very important that you see this is the right plane for dissection. The other tissue around is core plexus, telechoroidea but it's not the thin wall of a cyst. So we have to find the right place. 
So now I use my endoscopic sheath to retract the cyst a little bit up to get access here to the pedicle. So I coagulate some of the vessels, but I avoid, of course, closure of the sadomastoid vein. But again, I cut too early and you see there's some bleeding starting. It's not much. Under endoscopic view, every bleeding looks dangerous, but it's usually not. It's just a small bleeding, but we don't see very well. So in this case, I very early switched to the dry field technique. And you see immediately the bleeding stopped. Then I grasp the cyst again to bring it out into the lateral ventricle. And you see here, this is a vascular pedicle. So I have to fill the ventricle. And you see, this is a pedicle. This is here the pedicle, which has to be coagulated. And now again, I use the endoscopic sheath to push the cyst up over the fornix. And I have a nice view to the pedicle and I can coagulate and cut. Of course, it's not always, the pedicle is not always so long. Now the cyst is not fitting through my endoscopic sheath. So I have to remove the whole system to get the cyst out. And of course we make an inspection with a 45 degree endoscope and you see here is the fornix, condolateral foramen, no tumor. And this is a telechoroidea with the big vessels. And you see there is no no damage to the fornix, it's just superficial epidermal um, uh, laceration. And the patient is doing fine. So should you always aim for a total resection? You see, this was a patient from Kuwait. He has a huge cyst and the fornix is running here, very stretched over the, over the surface. So I open the septum widely. We make an evacuation of the cyst, but the the very thin, paper thin fornix was very attached to the ventricular wall. So I did not thought it is advisable to remove it because then clearly there will be a damage to the fornix. It was so thin like paper. So I just make another fenestration on the other side. And then I saw him three years after surgery. You see there's a re-expansion of the fornixes and he really improved in his memory function. So I thought in this case, particular case, it was not advisable to force for gross total resection of the membrane, which was attached to the fornices. But usually we have the um, aim of gross total resection. Should we always use an endoscope? This was a patient, she came to me because she had an endoscopic surgery at another institution and they failed to remove the cyst. And I looked at the images and said, hmm, why? Then I made a kiss sequence and you see, it seems to be, this is a cyst, here is a fornix. So I, I thought, why it's not possible? And as I, I told her, we start with the endoscope. It should work. If it's not working, maybe we have to switch to the microscope. And when we looked in, you see the whole cyst is covered by the fornix. So this is a foramen completely closed. And then of course you can open here with an endoscope the, um, the septum and tried to go in, but I did it microsurgically and removed it. It's another patient you see here, black cyst indicating a firm content, large cyst. You see here is the vessel, so it should be that the foramen is only of this size. And in this case, again, I told the patient we make an endoscopic inspection, but probably will do a microsurgical surgery and because there is a septum, a cave in the septum, the fornixes should be easily be separated. So we looked in to the ventricle and you see there is a, uh, is a cyst, but there's no foramen. So we removed the endoscope and we put this side view tube in and then we did a microsurgical operation. You see, that is the view. You see the cyst, of course, you can open here with an endoscope, but I thought it is more, it's less traumatic for fornix. So I separated the both fornices. If you have a, a cave of the septum, usually there is a good plane in between the fornices and you see the content is really very firm. So this may, cause problems with an endoscopic resection because you cannot aspirate. You have to take forceps to remove it piecemeal. Here's the internal cerebral veins. And you see here again, this is the right plane. This is the telechoridia. And this thin capsule, that is the right layer to go for. I cut the 
called plexus, which is very attached to the plexus, and then I removed it. And this patient had no problems with memory after surgery. We checked him with a psychologist. So it was really, I think, the right choice in this case. So after surgery, it's another patient. You see there's a huge ventricle. Again, you see here the fornices and only a small, small space here. The comp the, this is what you see with an endoscope. All this fornix, so I think to open in the midline is not a good idea. And you see the very small foramen. Of course, I could try to make it endoscopically in retrospect, I was thinking about, but in, at the time of the surgery, I thought the foramen is too small. And again, I inserted this endoscopic tube The side view, this is 12, 12 millimeters. And then you can, I can enlarge the foramen a little bit. And we have this shaft scissors to open it. You see the content is mainly liquid as we have seen, but there was a black dot in the T2 weighted. So there's a small solid component, but it, evacuation was very easy. And then again, we have to find the right plane. We should not pull on the telechoridia but just the cyst wall. And then the cyst is coming out very nicely. See, this is a cyst wall. And this is again the pedicle. And then with coagulation, you have easy control and you can take it out. The question is then, of course, if the tube is working so well, why we are not always using the tube. But I think as Pepe mentioned, the size of the tube is much larger than the endoscope. So if possible, I think the endoscope can be taken. But if you see there is some anatomical problem or there is a problem of the consistency on size of the cyst, then it's no problem to switch to the tube technique. I think the main goal of the surgery should be a gross total resection to have a cure of the patient. And that is what we have to compare our results with the microsurgical series. And then we close the tract with fibrin glue. So we published our series of surgeries from the beginning of our experience to the, I think to 28 or so. There were 16, uh, seven, no, 20, surgery, uh, 20 surgeries and 16 patients we could get for follow-up. And there were three patients where we had to leave a remnant. And in two of them, we had a recurrence. So if you leave a remnant, there is a risk of recurrence. What people say, you just have to evacuate and coagulate the cyst and nothing happened. I think this is not true. When you wait long enough with a long follow-up, then you will see there will become a recurrence. That's why our strategy is now to be more aggressive. And we published our technical, uh, our, our, our technique in a technical note in JNS uh, last year. And there were 16 patients and one was asymptomatic, mean size was 12 millimeters. And we had a good resection. We had to leave a small piece and one patient who was 76 years old and she requested the least invasive um, surgery, but otherwise we had a gross total resection, all of the patients and no uh, neurological problems. We had four venous hemorrhages, which were endoscopically controlled with dry field technique. And this was a lady, she presented with a memory deficit before and then in the follow-up after surgery, uh, she worsened. But I think this was an associated dementia of another type, but it was not related, I think, to the colloid cyst. So my conclusion is that in most colloid cysts and a safe endoscopic gross total resection is possible. And we should be radical as we have to compare our results with microsurgical series and uh, I think it's no problem if you see it's difficult with an endoscope, you switch to microsurgery to get the goal done of your uh, procedure. And finally, I want to invite you to the Naples workshop next year, uh, next week, I mean, <laughs> next week, there are still some places available. And then of course, I hope to see you all in Sydney and in Singapore for our World Congress. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Henry, for that uh, masterclass again. Uh, I, I see no questions, but uh, are there any comments? So uh, I had only one comment to make, uh, Henry. You, with I think your biomanual dissection, probably the content of the cyst does not matter because earlier we were worried whenever the cyst turned so dark on titubated images, uh, we found that it may be very difficult and uh, did not think about endoscopic procedures in those patients. But you have seen a couple of very successful cases. So yeah. in your criteria, it is that that is not an important point anymore. Oh, but if I see the cyst is very large, and you see the, it had really a like cyst two centimeters, and it's like a rock. So I start with an endoscope, and if you see that is really a, a nightmare to take it piecemeal out, then I would recommend that you switch to the tube technique. I think that is not worthwhile to sit long hours. Maybe the CUSA is working for this, I don't know. <laughs> but I think then you should switch to microsurgery. It should be a balanced thing. And the, the really with the tube, if you make an MRI after some years, it's really a small track what you see. It's certainly larger what you see with an endoscope, but I think it's not um, a catastrophe to use it. Kenichi, you have any comment before we yeah. hand over to Suresh yeah. and Manas? Thank you, Henley. I enjoyed. It. Yeah, I think the, that is a very important tips because uh, with usage of the the, uh, uh, the sheath as a retractor in one-handed endoscopic surgery. So I always use it uh, as as you as you uh, give us a video. So and uh, I wonder about uh, as you said that the CUSA the sonopet will be good to remove their uh, colloid cysts, their large colloid cysts. So you have any other ideas to one-handed endoscopic surgery to remove the colloid cyst? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, of course, as you mentioned, that the tube retractor and the cylinder surgery is one of the options to remove such a large cystic tumors in ventricle. Yeah, also when for intraventricular tumors, we use it. We start with an endoscope, and if you see it's too much blood or it's not efficient, then we switch to this tube because then you have larger forceps, you have bipolar coagulation. Mm. That depends. Maybe another question, which is not strictly about endoscopy, but in your technique, what I've observed is that whenever there has been a small foramen of Monroe, uh, you have not try to do a foraminoplasty or not try to do a subchoroidal or suprachoroidal, whatever uh, you want to call it, you know, trying to open into the choroid fissure. You have preferred to go through the septum uh, or, you know, through the uh, fornix itself between the two fornices. Uh, why are you reluctant to use the uh, choroidal approach? No, I use it. Sometimes, you know, Chandra, sometimes you have a cyst yeah. and this is widened the choroid fissure by itself. You see there is no fornix and thalamus, but it is just the telechoroidea because the cyst is pushing it aside. If I see there is just this connective tissue, the telar, then I would cut. But I see fornix and thalamus are close together. You know, even if you use it microsurgically, there's a lot of traction. You have to take a pedi, and there is a risk of damaging fornix and thalamus. And the thing, when I use it with an endoscope, I do it when I see there is already a separation by the lesion. Then it's easy. You just cut it. But I think to, to dissect in between the fornix and the thalamus, and you have this big thalamus dried vein, I think that would be um, too risky. And... I think I, I don't see an advantage. Then the other way to go the other way is much safer, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I also have the uh, same examination, but uh, I have seen a maybe video the phonics worse. <laughs> yeah, I have seen a video from one guy who shows the endoscopic splitting of the cord fissure, but the phonics did not look well mm -hmm. after this. Yes, right. So I think it must. Our technique should adapt to what we see. What is the anatomy? Sometimes that approach is better and sometimes it's the other one. 
So mm. we should be flexible. We look at the MRI, we look into the uh, surgical field, and then we make a decision what is the best. Mm. Thanks. Uh, Any other comments uh, before yeah. we ask uh, Ma Manas? Uh, I think you have uh, and uh, Suresh to then take over. Yeah. Manas, please. Can I ask a question, Dr. Suresh? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, man, that's quite true. How do you decide uh, which side uh, ventricle to uh, enter, the right side, the left side? The second question is, if you have a colloid cyst in the septum and ventricles are normal size, uh, what do you prefer, uh, still uh, endoscopic or interhemispheric? Or you do not do interhemispheric? You mean transcalosal? Yeah, transcalosal. Transcalosal I did in two cases. But if the cyst is really small and there's no ventricular dilation, the first question is, is it a good indication to make surgery? My <laughs> case was not a good indication for surgery. Yes, in, in the septum large one, I'm not telling... Uh, uh, Posteriorly placed cyst. The colloid cyst yeah. is in the septum pellicitum and it's a large one. So it's, it's an indication for surgery. Yeah, then I would, I would probably do transcalosal. I have two colloid cysts transcalosal, but it's, it's, uh, in this case, there was no ventricular dilation. It was a small cyst, and he always came. I sent him home, and for two years, he was visiting me in my clinic. And then finally, I said, okay, I take it out, and then there is silence. But then he came back and had, had still headache and still headache. It was, <laughs> was not a good idea. And the, the first question, the side is determined by the ventricular dilation. If I have unilateral ventricular dilation, I come usually from that side. And is the cyst more apparent in the foramen? So sometimes you see on a coronal view that the fornix is overlying the cyst on one side more than on the other. Then of course you go there where the, you have a wider foramen and you have less fornix covering the cyst. Thank you. So thanks everyone uh, for participating. Uh, I thank uh, uh, both the moderators for the session, uh, uh, Moody as well as uh, Kenichi uh, for their very valuable comments and uh, uh, their valuable time. Uh, and uh, all the speakers, I think two or three of them have left us. Professor Kappa Bianca has left us, I think. Uh, uh, Domenico yeah. has left us. Uh, yes. So I think uh, uh, if you have any last comments to make, uh, both the moderators, you can make comments. Otherwise, I hand it over back to Dr. Sankla. Suresh, you go ahead, please. All right, fine. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers and uh, the moderators to really you know, conduct this symposium so well. And uh, uh, I thank all the participation to be participants to be there till the end of this meeting. And uh, uh, really, uh, uh, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed this uh, symposium very well. I especially would like to thank uh, Dr. Dev Pujari to really arrange this symposium so well. Uh, and uh, my special thanks to Manas and Subodh for uh, arranging this symposium as a part of the seventh uh, annual conference of the Neuro Society of India, Neuro uh, Endoscopy Society of India. Uh, with that, I would really uh, uh, close this uh, session and uh, uh, hope that uh, everything goes well and we'll see you all in Singapore, uh, as Henry mentioned. And uh, before that Naples uh, meeting uh, uh, in the workshop, uh, with that, I think I close uh, this uh, session and uh, thank you very much, everybody. Once thank again, you. Manas and uh, uh, Subodh. Yeah, good night and namaste. Yeah. Yeah. It's Enjoy the tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, every time there is something new to learn and uh, some doubts get cleared up. So hopefully, it, it helps all of us in treating our patients better. Good night then. Good, Good night. night. Ken, Kenichi, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I know it's going to be too late in Japan, but uh, I just couldn't control the time. Thank no, you no. very much. No problem. I'm a neurosurgeon. I don't have a night. <laughs> <laughs> thank bye you. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.
Thank you, Abhiram. Abhiram, are you there? Sir, sir I am there, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you.